Hagman and the Hagman Report for today. It is Monday, September eighth, twenty fourteen. Just three years from, or three days from now, it'll be the thirteenth uh, anniversary of nine eleven. Don't forget, folks. I'm Doug Hagman, the co-host, along with my son Joe Hagman, in studio together. We are the Hagman and Hagman Report, folks. You're about to hear three hours of incredible programming. This tonight, I, we did not advertise this ahead of time tonight for. Uh, reasons which will become clear. However, uh, tonight we've got a fantastic show. We've got Mr. Tim Alperino on uh, the Alperino analysis. In fact, that will be going up on our website at some point during or immediately following our show. The link to Mr. Alperino, his, uh, the Alperino analysis, Genesis Six Giants, and of course Steve Quayle. But uh, it's going to be an incredible programming. We're going to be an incredible program tonight. We're going to be talking about super soldiers and. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be dumb, uh, the, you know, deep underground military bases. Huh? Uh, folks, you're listening to the only show where the news, and this is the news of today. It's presented to you in 3D. We look well beyond the headlines and bylines, bringing the news behind the news, bringing the information that you need to know today to be aware about, um, to be aware of, I should say, and, and to uh, uh, to look at in terms of uh, upcoming events. Folks, we broadcast live each and every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern time. That's 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern uh, on the East Coast. Of course, it's 5 to 8 on the or on the West Coast. 5 to 8 on the West Coast. Our home base, new home base, is Hagman and Hagman dot com. We will be experiencing, a, you will be seeing a very large um, update of information. Hopefully, this evening, later this evening, uh, throughout the next 24 hours. I'm releasing a lot of um, uh, report information from uh, reports that uh, investigative, uh, investigative research I've been doing, as well as surveillance, and uh, uh, I think you're going to find it pretty compelling. Also, look for it at CanadaFreePress.com. Folks, tonight we're also simulcast by the Christians United Broadcasting Network. There you can tune us in at the Hagman and Hagman Report. Com, not to be confused with Hagman and Hagman, of course, dot com. I want to thank each and every one of you for deliberately listening to us, deliberately joining us tonight. It's because of you. It's because of your belief and your trust in us as we as we maneuver through this minefield together that, that we exist, that we um, enjoy our current status right now of uh, being one of the top shows on BTR as well as uh, very highly ranked in iTunes uh, ahead of some pretty significant luminaries. I want to thank you for putting us there. And I want to thank you very much for being a part of our extended family. Just thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your notes, for your emails. We read them all. And I did have somebody email me and says, well, you never answer any of them. Well, we, we try to. We, we try to answer as many as possible. Uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, the volume is just tremendous. Having said that, Joe, welcome and uh, uh, welcome to the studio. And of course, you can bring on Mr. Alvarino at your, at your leisure here. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, Going to be a fantastic show. And he's, Mr. Alvarino has a lot of information to get into. Also, a fellow researcher will be joining uh, him at the top of the hour. Uh, Tim, are you with us? He is not. Tim, you're not coming through if you're there. You dropped off, I see, on his computer. So he'll be reconnecting here shortly. We do have um, a lot going on tonight, but uh, what Mr. Alberino is going to be talking about is super soldiers. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. There we go. There we go. I had to recall in on Skype. I don't know why. Yeah, it's a doggone NSA in the city of London and uh, everyone else that's uh, tagging along. Well, it's good to have you, uh, Tim. Uh, you're a very sought-after guest here at the Hagman and Hagman Report. Uh, uh, folks, if you haven't heard Tim's previous show, it's on SoundCloud.com. Go to Hagman and Hagman. Look at the uh, past show archive, uh, September or the month of August, I, I believe, and just go through the list. You'll see uh, show summaries for the month of August. You'll see uh, Tim Melbourino being on there, and uh, it was a fantastic show, just a tremendous show. So anyway, Tim, welcome back, sir. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for having me this evening. 
Well, it's our pleasure. Now, you've got some information. Steve called me at, uh, I think it was like 5 o'clock his time or 4.30 his time, and he said, hey, you got to have, you know, he said, he, he said Doug, uh, you got you got to get Tim on uh, as soon as possible. I think you were, you were scheduled for next week, or we were, we indicated uh, that you were going to be on next week, and he said, nah, man, the time, you know, the time is, is short, and get him on as soon as you can. So uh, tonight, tonight is it. And, folks, uh, Tim is a little bit under the weather, so. Uh, got to cut him some slack, and I think we all are here under the weather at Pat. I got to tell you, uh, it's just we, we feel like we've uh, we feel like you're running through a swimming pool. That's kind of how we feel. So that is that is exactly the way I feel. <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it's it's something. And I've talked to so many people who have respiratory problems or uh, on the on the cusp of respiratory problems. I don't know what the deal is, but something is not right. Anyway, having yeah. said that, so you start us off. You take us wherever you want us to go here. You've got some well, information. Interestingly enough, I think a lot of people, just to comment to what you just said, I think a lot of people are actually suffering from the uh, from symptoms associated with genetically modified food, the consumption of genetically modified food. And uh, because when I lived in Peru for eight years, my stomach was... I had a iron. I had an iron gut. I mean, I've eaten everything. I've eaten, you know, basically every species of monkey in the Amazon, and all different kind of creatures and anteaters and birds of many kinds, uh, all kinds of stuff, and never really had any problems until I came back to live in the United States again and started eating the food from the grocery store, and it. I mean, it absolutely wrecked my stomach. And I really? can tell you. And I can tell you for the listeners. Uh, I have Peruvian friends that moved to the United States, and their stomachs are also wrecked. And um, people will tell you that 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 is because they're not used to the food. Their stomach isn't used to processing uh, the kind of food that we eat here. But but more specifically, the real issue I believe is the genetically modified food uh, wreaks havoc on the gut and on the intestinal tract. I, I don't doubt that for a minute. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> But but forgive me for for asking this uh, pretty academic question. You said you ate every species of monkey. Is, is that something common? I mean, I'm, obviously it's common, right in Peru. Well, that's probably, that's a little bit of an overstatement. I, I've eaten many species of monkeys and many species of all kinds of animals. Um, not for fun, by the way, for out of necessity. Living in the Amazon is part of the culture. Uh, they call it bush meat. And uh, where I was, we were deep enough in the Amazon to where these animals were bountiful. It wasn't like we were killing the last species of monkey um, for those who are sensitive to those kind of issues. But, uh, yeah, it's just part of life in the Amazon is to uh, to eat whatever you can, whatever you can get your hands on, basically. Yeah, the last time I was on an Amazonian safari, they... Uh... Uh, we of course ate a five course. Um, no, I'm just kidding around. Uh, <laughs> my goodness. Okay. Well, the, no, that's real Amazonian um, survival tactics, apparently. Yeah. Uh, it, wow. It, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to to get into the culture like that and live with the families and see how they survive and and uh, really breaks you out a lot. Really, you realize how bizarre a grocery store is. Uh, after living for a while in a third world country where food has to be, you have to go out and get it, you know, not, and that doesn't mean driving your car to the store and, and, and buying the food wrapped in plastic. That means you have to go out and get it. <laughs> you have to go out and kill it or harvest it. Man, that, 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 that's, wow. Yeah, and people don't understand how how delicate our supply chain is here with the grocery stores and the, the you know, the three-day supply of food and and as, you know, as long as people can get their their lattes in the morning from Starbucks and and their uh, fresh produce and food for supper in the um, in the afternoon at the grocery store, everything is fine. And uh, that's the thin veil of uh, uh, of uh, false normalcy that we see here in the United States, and people are are hiding behind that, or at least that's blinding people to the truth. But but we're getting a little off subject, Tim. Um, super soldiers, things that are taking place. And by the way, folks, the Alberino analysis, if you go to stevequail.com and you click on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side is a direct link to the Alberino analysis. Uh, it's a fantastic 
video, audio, video, uh, plethora of, of audio and videos uh, there. Uh, the YouTube uh, uh, YouTube channel, definitely. It's Genesis 6 Giants official Steve Quayle channel. Having said that, sir, go ahead and uh, fire away. Yeah, well, this um, basically uh, I decided to do a, an, an analysis on super soldiers. I talked to Steve, and he suggested that uh, we do something on super soldiers, which ha- happens to be um, it's a very, very broad subject because there's so much information concerning uh, what the government is doing, I wish that I could rattle off the dozens, more than dozens of projects uh, that are ongoing and that are declassified projects. I don't have that information in front of me. Um, There's so much information out there involving, uh, concerning the the different uh, robotics, the genetics, the nanotechnology, uh, different... um, technologies that are being developed to be used by soldiers of the future on the battlefield and are already being deployed. Uh, Most of it is being deployed covertly. Uh, Most of what we see, this is something that uh, was really an awakening for me some years back when I realized that most of the equipment that we see being deployed on the battlefields, on the news networks, is, is old hat and that's cons- that's speaking conservatively. I mean, the, the stuff that they actually are using in the theaters of war on television, uh, we were at that. We were at those levels of that equipment back in the '60s and '70s, even the '50s. Um, so there is a massive amount of technology that uh, the militaries of the civilized world, of the developed world, have that they use covertly. Uh, technologies that are being used in the background, but specifically speaking to this idea of super soldiers, um, the government, the Pentagon, is extremely involved in the engineering of these superhuman fighting uh, machines. And basically, we've been inundated over the last 10 years with superhero movies one after another. To this point, I think a lot of people are getting superhero movie fatigue. I mean, there's a new superhero movie coming out every six months, um, at least every year. And that's been going on for, what, 10 years now, Um, starting with the Spider-Man movies. And, of course, you've got the old Batman movies, but but I'm talking about a a re-emergence and a surge of superhero movies uh, that have been coming out one after another, and I don't have to rattle them, all, rattle them all off right now. People know what movies I'm referring to. And most people go to these movies, um, they go sit in the theater or they, or they go rent it or, or pull it up on their on their TV, and uh, they just kind of they watch it as if it's just entertainment, but it's not just entertainment. There's actually an agenda behind uh behind what they're doing with these movies and um, without getting too conspiratorial um, they for one thing they tell us what they're doing before they do it but but another thing because movies are such a uh, concrete part of uh, of our lives as Americans in the whole western world and developed world it's a good way to acclimate us to new technology it's a good way to acclimate us to things that are coming in the future. It, it, it's, it's a way to engage us without having to politically engage us because most, most Americans, I shouldn't say most Americans, I should say a, a, a very large collective of Americans at this point do not even have the capacity to think in political terms, to, to, to think in strategic terms, um, which is a sad statement. But, uh, and I always make, and, and I always make this uh, statement to my friends. I lived away from television for a long period of time, um, you know, years on end without really having access or caring to have access to television. I would get my news on the Internet, uh, but I really wouldn't be engaged in television. So I was out of the – I wasn't seeing the commercials. I wasn't seeing the – well, the movies I was seeing, but I wasn't seeing the the, the, – the television programming, specifically television programming. And it was very, very shocking for me when I came back into society 
um, to watch TV. Right. They, people don't understand that when when they're talking to us through the television, uh, the, the different programs, the, the commercials, especially the commercials, they're talking to you like you're a three-year-old. That's an exaggeration. They're talking to you like you're a 12-year-old. They're talking to you like you're a drooling from the mouth idiot. And 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 people don't realize it because um, it's the old uh, uh, the 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 slowly boiled boiled frog scenario where you don't really realize it unless you step away from it for a good amount of time and then you come back and turn the TV on. It's offensive. They literally talk down to us on TV like we're dummies. Not as if they're smart. And when I say they, when I refer to they, I'm just talking about the networks, the programming. And, and, and this, this ties into the super soldier stuff, so I'll get there in a minute. But uh, especially the cartoons, it, one of the most appalling things are these modern cartoons. If you watch some of these programs that seem so innocent and innocuous at face value, if you actually sit down and watch the episodes of these programmings, of these uh, programs for children, especially like on the Cartoon Network, it is mush for their brains. And I mean that quite literally. It, it, it basically deprograms their brains. And I'm not saying that because that's something I, it's some, like, again, it's some grand conspiracy. No, it's, it is painfully obvious. Just sit there and watch one of these cartoons on Cartoon Network, for example. And Cartoon Network is one of the worst offenders. Uh, it, it, it literally just, uh, it, it takes any intellectual capacity that a child has, it takes their capacity for strategic thought, um, their capacity to reason, and it just basically fills their mind with mush. The, the cartoons, they don't make any sense. All the characters are absurd. They're absurd. There's no, they're like mental cases. If these characters were real that are in these cartoons, they would all be in straitjackets. They're mental cases. And it's, and it's part of the uh, brainwashing of, of children. And, of course, you'll always have people who roll their eyes, but th this is not a conspiracy. Just watch one of those cartoons and think logically as you're watching it. And so, basically, um, people don't understand that, uh, you know, they've staged a lot of things, for example, in the, in the news. And um, I wish I could refer to the specific examples, but there have been a handful of examples where network news has been actually caught staging, green screening on top of their facilities or in, or in, or in, uh, or in their studio, pretending that they're in Iraq or that they're in Afghanistan or something, and they're ducking. And, you know, I, there's some famous ones on YouTube, um, and, and these are absolutely documented facts uh, that these network news agencies will do this. They'll pretend, like I said, that they're on the field of battle. And the point in saying all of this is to get you to understand that what you're being shown, anytime you're shown a theater of war, you're not really being shown what's actually happening. There's two things that are going on. Number one, you're always going to get a very censored view of what's happening and uh, a very controlled view. In fact, very narrow. A, ner a very narrow view. Americans get a very different version of the news than, than um, people from the United Kingdom, for example, although they're pretty close, but even still, there's a, there's a, there's a different version. But if you get away uh, from the United States and you go, for example, to Peru or somewhere in Africa and you watch the news, it's a very, very, very different perspective on what's happening in the news. And, um, and, it's not, and I'm not just referring to a bias against the United States or a hate of capitalism or um, imperialism, uh, but... Uh, a, a very different, just different information. The raw data is different coming in. For example, I was in Peru during the uh, the Iraq War, and when the when the Iraq War started, and the way that the Peruvian news would cover the Iraq War was was I uh, was distinctly different than the way that uh, CNN and ABC and NBC and the major networks were covering it. Okay, so that's one thing. You, when you see equipment in the field of battle and you see what we're doing, and you see what we're deploying, it's a, it's a half-truth, basically. But there's something even more scandalous happening uh, behind that curtain. There's something that people can't even wrap their minds around, which is the idea of what's called uh, 
what's called, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, a breakaway civilization. That's a term that was coined by Richard Nolan, ufologist Richard Nolan. Breakaway civilization, in other words, there are agencies, there are factions that are not necessary that do not necessarily belong to governments in all cases. Uh, they're private military contractors in certain cases. They're different factions that are controlled by the Illuminati or the different dark brotherhoods that are uh, functioning right now on the planet. And they have technology. Uh, I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, they have technology that 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 surpasses what has been seen in Star Wars and, and on Star Trek. And has it been used, though? That's the, see, that's the, that's the real issue. The answer to that is yes and no. Yes, it has been used covertly. And the thing is that most of this technology, in my opinion, they use against us, you know, against the, uh, against, uh, the, 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 the Pentagon doesn't really consider ISIS the terrorists. We all know that they consider us the terrorists. We're the terrorists. They're not concerned with ISIS over there beheading a bunch of people and uh, crucifying people and, and cutting babies in two. They're concerned with us. They look at us the way that we look at ISIS. That's the way that these factions look at us. They have that same disgust for us. And uh, so a lot of the technologies, the, the very high-tech technologies that should be deployed overseas are actually deployed over our country and are spying on us, which is infuriating. It's absolutely infuriating because uh, it's a lot of our money that's funded not all of our money, but a lot of our money has funded that technology, and they're, and they're using it to basically encroach on our privacy. Um, and so I'm who, referring to... Who's, who's authorizing this? If I, I, and, and pardon the interruptions, but, but I, 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 like, for example, um, you're talking about non-governmental uh, organizations. Uh, we'll just pick one out, for example, like the, the uh, Blackwater. Okay? Um, people know Blackwater. Mm -hmm. Um, is that the kind, I'm not saying Blackwater is, but is that the kind of non-governmental uh, organization you're referring to? And if so, yep. who, okay. Yep. Not, not, Black, and Hutt, Black and Hutt's another okay. popular one that people know about. Private military contractors. The government, um, a misnomer about the government is that the government doesn't micromanage everything. It just can't. It doesn't. The government hires private contractors, and most people uh, are familiar with that. And so, obviously, the, the military-industrial complex is part of that. That's what Eisenhower warned about. And these private contractors, they're given the funds, which come partly from us. <clears throat> the above board, uh, the, the projects that are known are funded with taxpayer do dollars uh, through the, the, through the co congressional budget. But the projects that, are, that they don't want anybody to know are, are funded through what's called the black budget. And the black budget they get their funds through extremely nefarious activities like gun running, like uh, drug running. They do, um, they're, they're involved in the um, prostitution. They're involved, every, it's basically the, the, the most wicked, vile, corrupt uh, activities are where they draw that money from. So uh, they're, they're actually even involved in the sex trade. Um, and these are organizations. The CIA has ties to this stuff. The NSA, I'm sure, has ties to this stuff. The CIA, definitely. And they derive, uh, they have these income streams that the public has no idea about. And why would they do that? Well, it's very simple, because they want to fund things that, the, that they don't want the public to have any idea about. They don't want public debate about the things that they're doing in secret. That's why you do things in secret. That's why you do things in secret. Um, the Bible is very clear about that. You know, they, 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 they practice their, their wickedness in secret away from the eyes and scrutiny of the public. And so what they're doing in these black budget projects is morally questionable activities, to put it extremely lightly. Um, and that's where all the real experimentation is happening, is behind the curtain of those black budget projects. So you have these projects that are being funded by nefarious income streams and they're completely kept away from the public eye for two reasons, because they would be morally apprehensible for one thing. And another thing is that they don't want, like I said, the public debate. They don't want to have a public debate uh, concerning whether or not it's ethical to mix, to cross 
a human genome with that of a tiger, for example, and that's not something that they're necessarily doing exactly that scenario, but just to give you the idea, they don't want to have the public debate about that because obviously there's a public debate. And on the on the on the surface level that we all live on, that that's a very debatable issue, obviously. And there's so many different um, hang-ups that, that that you run into when you talk about cross-species genetics. I mean, does the entity have a soul? How how human is the entity? Where are the borderlines between human and non-human, and, and and all sorts of things that Tom Horn and and Steve and Steve Quayle really document, um, especially in Steve's book Xenogenesis. You know, these exactly. things are these things are um, these these are arguments that, as far as the Pentagon is concerned, they don't have time for them. And on one level, you can understand why they don't have time for them because the Chinese don't don't care about those arguments. The Russians don't care about those arguments. You think the Chinese care about having those kind of discussions in a public forum? So on one hand, you can understand the impetus that's driving this uh, at the Pentagon. They're thinking we've got to catch up or we've got to play uh, the same game by the same rules. And those rules are rules of secrecy and lying, deception. And so in order to compete with some of these other nations that are already beginning what's, what's referred to as the new arms race, by the Jasons, by the way, um, and different government think tanks, this is the new arms race. Actually, I would say this is part of the new arms race. Um, the other part of the new arms race involves the, the different uh, aeronomical vehicles that they have flying around in space between the planets. Yes, I said between the planets to the moon and all these different places where they actually have installed bases. Um, and so, uh, but this is a part of that, uh, this is a part of that whole scenario is the engineering of super soldiers. And that engineering is happening, uh, they're, in, they're incorporating, they're integrating many different kinds of technology. I mentioned a few of them already, the uh, genetics, right. the robotics, the nanotech. The, in the artificial intelligence. Well, uh, Tim, if I can stop you right there for a second, because we're still, I, I, in my mind a little bit, I'm still on the who. Um, okay, so you're talking about non-governmental agencies, but, but how far up the chain uh, does this information go? For example, does Obama, uh, Biden, do they know about this? Does uh, uh, Bonnier, Pelosi, do they know about this? Or No, the, they know. Yeah. It depends on what you're talking about. Do they know about... Some of the more do they know about some of the more innocuous projects? Yes. Do they do they know some? Of, remember, there's there's plausible deniability involved in this too. So there's some things that uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be good for them to know in terms of if it ever came out, if it ever you know came to the light of day, they could step step back and say we had absolutely no knowledge about this, and that's something that Obama is a professional at doing. He learned about it from the news. I mean, you know, he'll learn about it. He'll learn about it from Fox News or CNN, just like us. That's plausible deniability. Although most of the time he's lying about that, but 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 he would be telling the truth when it comes to these black budget projects. Look, presidents come and go. Pre the, the, the 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 office of the president in this country was once an esteemed, honored office, especially especially back in the days of uh, Eisenhower, Truman, and the guys before them. It, it's a joke now. It's a joke to the guys at the NSA. Uh, presidents come and go, but the, the but the chief of the NSA stays. What is it for ten years or whatever it is? And I think the CIA is even longer, if I if I'm correct. But some of these agencies, there's agencies that are functioning that that people still don't know about. Remember, some years ago, I forget how many years it was. What was it? Fifteen years ago? Twenty years ago? Pe most people didn't even realize that there was such a thing as the NSA. I mean. Uh, it's an absurdity at this point, if you think about it in the context of 20 years ago, to, to, to turn on Fox News and to see Brett Baer interviewing the, the chief of the NSA, the director of the NSA. It, it, for guys, for people who have done their homework and who have investigated this, the NSA and these different organizations, that's, that's absurd to, to think that in the days we live in, they're actually showing the face of the guy that runs the NSA. Because the, 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 I contend that one of the most powerful people in the United States is the director of the NSA. So, yeah. so, so, the, so the presidents are just, they, they, these are just Illuminati frontmen and uh, uh, mind-controlled 
Um, they have all the Manchurian candidates. Manchurian candidates. They have programming. They have um, Luciferian programming. Those are the kind of guys that that become the president of the United States. You, gone are the days of of Dwight Eisenhower. Believe me. Understood. And, okay. And um, and, and know, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense when you think about it. If you're going to do things, you're going to do things like this. You're going to do things under the uh, under the, the the cover of darkness, and obviously you're not going to have the uh, the most um, a seen man, well, or transparent, allegedly transparent people, uh, uh, you know, knowing about this kind of stuff. Uh, so it, Brennan, CIA, obviously knows about a lot of this. Although, although I would say that the CIA chief probably does know about a lot of it, but I don't think the CIA is as powerful anymore as it used to be. Okay. I think that because the CIA came into popu- showed up into the popular American uh into American pop culture that they had to create another organization behind the CIA because whenever something comes to the light, if you're doing something that's nefarious, if you're doing something wicked, you ha- it's like a cockroach, you run back under the refrigerator. So they'll push the CIA out there now as this is the big secret thing in the United States or even the NSA at this point because they're already fashioning other organizations or they already have other organizations behind the scenes that hardly anybody knows about. People don't have any clue the different factions that are functioning behind the scenes. And I did mention the military-industrial complex, these private contractors have – people have to understand how how much power these private contractors have. Let me let me put it in this context. Let's say that um, the Defense Department gives you a contract as a private contractor to develop, uh, let's say, an aeronautical vehicle, a a let's just call it an airplane for the sake of argument, an airplane that can fly to Mars. They 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 know the technology exists, so they know that it can exist. And they give you that technology as a private contractor. They give you the funding. They give you the military base, which is almost always going to be some secret deep underground military base. You referred to the dumb to deep underground military base. So you have the tools. You have the money. And now you have the contract from the government, and you are manufacturing this technology. What is what is what is in play in this scenario that is going to force the private contractor to divulge or to disclose everything, all the scientific breakthroughs that they're making to the government. Uh, In other words, um, how can we know as American citizens that these private contractors are being forthright with the government, which is supposed to be an extension of us? How do we know? How do we know that they're not hiding files, that they're not hiding technologies? In many cases, we know that they're, uh, they're double dipping. They're 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 selling these technologies to other countries as well in some cases. But what's even more concerning to me is if they are working with high technology. Again, referring to the uh, illustration that that I gave concerning an airplane that can fly to Mars. How do we know that that once they turn over some of this information to the government, that they're not secretly building their own airplanes or they're not secretly doing things on Mars themselves because these organizations work like mafias. They, can, they have their own military force. That's why a lot of times if you try and encroach on some of these mil- military bases, you will get, um, you'll, you'll be flocked all of a sudden by uh, SUVs and, 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 and seemingly military personnel that don't have logos or insignias on their uniforms. That's because they're not directly working for the United States government. That's why they don't care about your rights. You think they care about your rights? Your rights mean nothing to them. They don't work for your government. They work for their employer, whether their employer is Hackenhut or whoever. They work for their employer. They wow. pretend to be military. It's a guise. They're not working for your government. In other words, they're not working for you. And by the way, in many cases, they're not funded, like I said before, by your money. So you can sit there and say, hey, it's my tax, uh, it's my tax dollars that are funding this facility, for example, uh, the S Force facility at Groom Laker or, or whatever, and it, it, it's not really true. It's not really true. Maybe to a degree, but but not really. They're they're getting their money from the most despicable sources that I that I mentioned earlier. 
So it's okay. a very convoluted situation. There are so many factions at play, and you have to wonder, Doug, does the government really have a handle on that situation? What if some of these military question. contractors go rogue? What if they had developed this technology, and in many cases we're talking about uh, very, very powerful technology, and they decide that, you know what, we're done working with you. Well, who are they working with at that point? I mean, you can envision a, an internal war, and probably has happened between the Pentagon and some of these contractors that have gone astray. When well, you well, well, Tim, I, I, sorry for interrupting, but would this also include, for example, the wars that, or, or uh, we, we just not only do we have to worry about the, the NGOs and our government, but what about the NGOs, our government, and we'll say the Russians or the Chinese or other governments as well? Is there a war going on, or are they all tied Absolutely. at the hip? Okay, all right. Well, it, it is so convoluted, Doug. The answer to that question, unfortunately, is is yes and no. I mean, it, it is so convoluted, so splintered, so compartmentalized at this point that I believe that the the guys that are that are in the background running all of this stuff are scrambling every day because it's it's so out of control. I believe it is absolutely out of control at this point. Um, DARPA, for example, a good example is, is, is DARPA is funding some projects to create. They're, they're just beginning to dip their toe publicly in genetic modification of human beings. And so you'll see these, uh, these articles coming out in Wired Magazine or whatever. And, of course, we all know about the singularity now. And we're all familiar with transhumanism. And, and it, it, they want you to think that they're just beginning to dip their toe into that cesspool when in reality that's not true. They've been doing this for years. They've been already developing. It's almost like here's what they do. They go and they develop this technology that would be questionable to the public. They go and they develop it to its max or at least as, uh, to, to the point that they're comfortable with where they feel like they have a handle on it, and then they pretend like they're just starting to develop it in the public forum. That's what I was referring to in the, begin in the beginning uh, when I was talking about the uh, the news agencies showing you theaters of war and, and we're using the Abrams tank and this and that, you know that that's uh, it's ludicrous. It, it really is ludicrous. Listen, um, I'm looking at some notes here. That's Listen, fine. we were back in the 1980s. We were, and this is on record, by the way. This is absolute documented fact. Back in the 1980s, we were flying the SR-71 Blackbird and its predecessor. The Aurora, back in the 1980s, and, and those are projects that were developed in Area 51. These aircraft are far superior to what we're using in, uh, on, the, on the, let me say it this way, the conventional theaters of war. That, the, the aircraft that, that we're using on the conventional theaters of war, and that's anywhere on the surface of the planet that the news covers. That's a conventional theater of war because the unconventional theater of war, theaters of war, include the moon, include Mars. These guys are using Stargate technology. I mean, uh, you can see why at this point in time it is so hard for people to catch up. It just, it's, it's such a, it's such, it, it, it just blows your brains out. The, the amount of information is just such a download, a data dump when you really tap into what's going on. It is at this point so overwhelming because they're so far ahead. I mean, they are so far ahead with the, de with the technology. So when we talk about the development of super soldiers, if we see that, there's, that there is an agenda to develop super soldiers on the, on the surface, understand that they've already done everything they're thinking about doing on the surface. They've already done it under the ground. There are over 200 deep underground military bases just in the United States. And when I say deep underground military bases, we're talking about bases that go miles down. There are not only – these aren't just little bases with a, a few rooms and uh, maybe a few underground hangars. These are, in some cases, cities. These are cities under the ground. Now, I know we're varying a little bit off of the super soldier. This all ties into the idea of super soldiers – I have a question, and this is verifiable, absolutely verifiable that these uh, underground bases exist. They're all connected by magneto-leviton trains, or maybe they have an even more advanced technology at this point, but it was said some 20 years ago that those trains could, could, could cross 
from the East Coast to the West Coast in 45 minutes. So these um, underground bases, are they're all networked together. They all have different purposes. They're all run, some of them are run by different factions. Some of them are legitimate. Some of them are legitimate pe- Pentagon installations uh, that are, that are, built for the president or whatever, for the Congress, such as the ones at Weather Mountain, which is, again, that's old hat too. But the idea is, let me just paint a scenario. This is a very scary scenario, and this is probably going to be a very uncomfortable uh, two hours for people who are listening who don't know about this stuff. What happens when you have advanced technology and you have hundreds of underground bases, massive, enormous underground bases, with all kinds of laboratories and and they have their own food supplies and and they're using technology like the like like the Jetsons compared to what we're using under there, and what happens when there's that much secrecy? What if there is a whole generation of human beings that have lived and died under the ground that nobody knows about? I mean, is that is that a a a ridiculous postulate? I think it's logical. If they're doing this, and we know much of what they're doing is nefarious, and we know that the Illuminati is involved, and we know that the occult is involved, then the, what they are doing beneath the soils of our cities, beneath the soils of our quiet suburbs, the things that they're doing are the most vile, wicked, nightmarish things that you could ever imagine. There are no Hollywood movies that can accurately paint the picture of some of the things that are happening, again, beneath the soils of our quaint, quiet suburbs. Oh, 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 but, Tim, somebody's got to build. Okay, this might sound totally naive uh, to the listeners, but I'm sure somebody out there is thinking this. People have, there are people that have had to build these cities. Yes. Okay, how can you, how can you keep these people quiet? I, I mean, wouldn't they wouldn't haven't been know? able to well sure people have come out and leaked all kinds of information about underground bases and in most cases they die remember phil schneider i don't know if you're familiar with phil schneider yes uh phil schneider who was uh uh making his rounds i think it was in the in the 90s uh, he was on a speaking circuit and uh he had 13 attempts on his life in one year 13 attempts and phil schneider was a geologist working for some of these private military contractors uh, and other organizations, sometimes directly for the government, sometimes for the contractors. And so he he had a very high clearance. I don't know exactly what clearance he had. I think he mentions it in some of his videos. Uh, But Phil Schneider was involved in the building of one of the most uh, well-known underground bases, the the underground base at Groom Lake. And Phil Schneider, he has an absolutely amazing story. His, His testimony is absolutely amazing about what happened to him. I don't have time to go into it now, but... For people who haven't heard of Phil Schneider, look up Phil Schneider on the YouTube. On YouTube, this is again, again, this is somebody who had 13 attempts on his life in one year. They finally got him on the 14th. They choked him with a catheter, and tied his hands behind his back and choked him with a catheter. Uh, and Tim, that's what happens. Remember- These guys, they come out of the, they come out and they they divulge secrets and they end up like Phil Schneider. Yeah, and if I remember I'm correctly, sorry, Joe, the, the police ruled that death a suicide. Oh, yeah, they they ruled it a suicide. His hands were tied behind his back, and they choked to death with, death with a catheter. That's <laughs> yeah. And he exposed yeah. the Denver and his, International Airport underground. Um, yes, he did. Areas there. Yes, yeah, he, he is. I would also uh, do what Tim suge- suggested and, and look him up and look up um, some of his uh, speeches. They are very important. They are. They are. And that man. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he was, high, this isn't just some conspiracy theorist. This guy was high level, a top geologist. I think he mentioned that there were only 13, I think it was 13 or 10 or 8, somewhere in there. There only, let's just say 13 for the sake of, or 8 people in, in, the, in the civilian world that had the clearance that he had because he, he was involved in building these deep underground military bases. And, um, and again, that's why these things leak. They leak into the public domain. But they're automatically, they're automatically, uh, there's a first, first of all, let me say this. There are on the internet pictures 
let's let's just say this. There are pictures on the internet of real aliens. Okay, real. Uh, uh, what do they call them? Um, the EBEs. There are real pictures of these entities on the internet. However, you'll never realize, you'll never be able to find out which ones are real. Why? I'll tell you why. Here's the strategy, and this goes for the underground bases. This goes for the bases on the moon. This goes for the bases on Mars. This goes for the super soldier projects. This goes for everything that has to deal with what we're talking about. The reason why you'll, you'll never find them is because the government doesn't go and try and take them off. The Internet's too big, too many people connected. Somebody can upload another one, the same one, you know, next week or whatever. The documents can be emailed to a 1,000 people at one time. That's not a winning strategy. The government will not go and try to eradicate that information off of the Internet. In most cases, it does employ that strategy in certain cases. But what I find is far more common is what the government will do instead of, let's say, let, let's say that there's a video, an autopsy of some kind of an alien or something that's online that's real. What the government will do is they'll produce a fake one or they'll produce 20 fake ones and they'll inundate the Internet with fake ones rather than try and get rid of the real one. That's the strategy that they employ. Anything that's true, rather than trying to weed it out because it draws attention, because it basically certifies, for example, in Phil Snyder's case, that that man was telling the truth. So instead of trying to, I mean, in his case, they went and killed him. I think that's what they were doing in the beginning until the Internet came around. Once the Internet came around, they had to change their strategy. So at this point, they're just inundating the, the Internet with fake stuff. Disinfo agents are everywhere. They call them trolls when it, on the Internet. Uh, if somebody posts up a video that's credible about a UFO or this or that or giants or something like that, you'll get 20 trolls will hit that video and comment. And they have this whole, and it's probably at this point, it's probably what I would call troll bots that are not even humans, that are it's controlled by a, a computer system, where they'll go and they'll, and they'll try and undermine and discredit. And let me tell you something, it works. It works because a lot of people will look at a video and say, I wonder if that's true. And then they'll look down and read the comment and somebody's, uh, trying to debunk it or, or making some kind of a stupid comment about it. And it, and, it, and it absolutely dispels your wondering if that was true. It, 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 uh, it quenches it. And this is something that they're actively engaged in, especially when it comes to the Internet. And it's the most difficult uh, tactic to fight against. We found out this with um, the Loretta Fuddy, the video with respect to uh, the uh, Loretta Fuddy, the dire uh, director of the Hawaiian Department of Health, the uh, December 11, 2013 plane crash, where there was video taken. There were some very unusual things in that video. And, of course, that was posted to the Internet. It took 30 days for it to be posted. And th there's a question there. But having said that, uh, certain anomalies appeared with respect to that video. Well, what happened was, on, on, on so-called friendly forums, even uh, forums friendly to the um, question of, of Obama's eligibility. In other words, you know, people who don't believe that he was, or people who believe he's a Mediterranean candidate. The the uh, uh, the number, the amount of comments were um, out of balance. In other words. There were so many people saying, oh, you are just absolutely out of your mind. You're seeing things. This is wrong. When, in fact, uh, the actual video itself, by the way, was edited on uh, the major TV networks, um, and, and we have proof of that as well. So I guess what I'm saying to you, Tim, is that you're absolutely 100% correct. This is a tactic that's used. And it's no longer, hey, let's censor the information, but let's flood the um, Internet with uh, false this info. Yeah. This info. And, yeah, and let's also go after the messenger. And let's, let's make it so sublime or take it to the other extreme um, that it, it, just, it just really creates a, a mess. For and the only reason it works, the only reason it works, Doug, is because, I hate to say it, but the vast majority of Americans are stupid. That's the only reason it works, and I and, and I don't mean to be offensive, but it is the truth. The vast the more the vast majority of Americans are stupid, and it's it's not entirely their fault. I mean, from the moment that they were young and put in front of a television, and and you know they went to in high school and public high public school is is especially public high school, is is the 
is I always refer to it as, as the worst thing that can happen to an intelligent young person is to go to public high school. And uh, uh, so, so yeah, so the, the objective is to inundate the Internet, especially the Internet, with disinformation because the news networks, they're not going to cover most of this stuff. The only place you're going to find the truth is if you go to the Internet, you know, Steve Quayle's website, if you listen to your guys' broadcast, read the Tom Horn books and all these other guys out there, look at the Phil Schneider videos. That's where you're going to learn the truth, but you have to have discernment. You have to know, you have to have um, uh, the faculty of critical thinking, which we're not being taught, especially with um, with the uh, the new agendas with, uh, what do you call that new cu- curriculum? Um, uh, common, the common Core. core. Common core. Yeah. Common core. I mean they're 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 intentionally uh they're intentionally breaking down the process of critical thought and they're making it they're dumbing it down to such a point that young people will not know how to think critically. I mean they already don't. H- have you had a conversation with a teenager lately? I mean <laughs> they already don't think critically. And and this is a va- this is a vast vastly different than the young people from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, the very the very way that we think has been molded and changed. They don't want us to think critically. They want us. Sure. The first thing they want us to think, if we see something questionable, if we if we consider something like UFOs or super soldiers, they want the word conspiracy to just flash in our brains in big yellow letters. That's programming, by the way. That's what they want you to think. If you if you hear about Russian soldiers training and in military bases in the United States, the first thing they want to pop into your head is conspiracy. And that was actually a CIA initiative, I think, back in the 50s. And Interesting. so uh, before the break, let me let me quickly cover something here, specifically relating to super soldiers, because I know I'm all over the map. i got some brain fog, brain fog going on this evening. But um, let me cover this 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 solicitation that came out. And, and Steve covers this in uh, Vino Genesis. I'm going to do a very brief analysis of it real quick, but Steve does a very good job covering this thoroughly in Xenogenesis. This is uh, the, a solicitation that came out in 2013. It, it's a DARPA solicitation funded by the Defense Department. It, the title of the solicitation is Advanced Tools for Mammalian Genome Engineering. Now, listen to the objective. And for those of you who want to look this up, it's the, the registry number is DARPA STTR FY2 013B. So the objective on this for this project, Advanced Tools for, for Mammalian Genome Engineering, is to improve the utility of human artificial chromosomes, or HACs as they're called, by developing a new selectable metabolic marker for use in human cells, new high fidelity methods for inserting DNA constructs of at least 50,000 base pairs in length and to define genomic loci and new methodologies for facile intercellular genome transplantation. Now, that's, uh, I know that that's uh, real scientific for a lot of people, but just focus on, and I cover this in my video, uh, the over analysis that I finished yesterday. I cover this so that I break it down. The important thing to understand here is the term human artificial chromosomes. How many people know that we at this point in time, right now, in fact, we've had it for a number of years now, have a synthetic chromosome, a 47th chromosome. We have a platform through which significant and drastic alterations to the human genome can be implemented. It's called an artificial chromosome, human artificial chromosome, hack. Now, this project isn't to create hacks. This project is to improve the utility of hacks. That platform, you, uh, some people have heard about the gene gun. The gene gun technology is, is old technology. In the beginning, um, we were uh, using a very crude form of technology for, gene- for genetic modification, which was to uh, basically uh, blast holes in the cells with genetic information, blast holes in the cells, basically penetrate by force, penetrate the cells by force with with the genetic information that we wanted to insert. And that was a very clumsy procedure. And then we started using um, virus vectors, which we would use viruses. We would empty out the genetic information that they usually deposit into the cell. 
and we would put our own genetic information. But but both of those procedures are extremely limiting. You can only you can only basically insert tiny snippets of DNA using those procedures. So what we've done is we've created an artificial chromosome. We went and said, instead of having 46 chromosomes, let's create a 47th chromosome. It's a lot smaller than our other chromosomes, but it can contain far greater amounts of genetic data than the, than the uh, gene gun and the uh, virus vector platforms. This platform, the hack platform, they know that it's capable, and this is coming from the document, that hacks have the capacity to contain extremely large segments of DNA, potentially up to or surpassing one million base pairs. All right, so that means that they, if they use these hacks to their full capacity, they can modify one million base pairs at a time in the, in the human genome. That is significant change. And I, and I don't have time to break down what base pairs are and, and all the genetics. Just understand this. That's vastly superior to gene gun technology and to vector virus, uh, uh, virus vector technology for manipulating the human genome. And look what they can already do with the vector viruses and what, 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 with, with what they're doing at Monsanto, the extreme alterations that they're already able to produce in plants. Uh, this is way more powerful than that. And this document purports to be, this project purports to be for civilian use, basically. They're talking about, you know, they, they, they want this to be, um, they want this technology to be applied in the private sector um, and in the public sector. So they're pretending like this is for the public good. And, yes, this technology is coming. It's called the genetic revolution. It's coming. It's right around the corner. There will be a genetic revolution, and it will change everything. But... The real agenda here is super soldier technology. They want to be able to modify vast amounts of genetic information, genetic material in human beings because and this, is, this is one of the primary ways genetics that they're building these super soldiers. Now, take that information. That is a real, that was a real solicitation by the Department of Defense, by DARPA. That solicitation has become a project. That project is underway right now. In the future, there will be an artificial 47th chromosome available to the public. Okay? That's why in my video I call this the end, the beginning of the end of humanity as we know it. This is the beginning of the end of humanity as we know it. We, are, we have a 47th chromosome and the kind of material that obviously the, the public sector they're going to uh, they're going to focus on eradicating the genetics that caught, that lead to cancer. They're going to they're going to you know it's going to start off gene to um, it's going to start off splicing human genes to human genes. But we're going to realize really quickly, and we already know this by the way, that there are uh, vastly more significant modifications that can be made, upgrades, if you will, if you will. That's what the transhumanists. A community views it as if we splice non-human DNA into the human genome, we can we can, for example, eradicate. We know this already. We can eradicate certain kinds of cancer. So, but you can't just pull material out of the human genome. You have to to pull a piece out and replace it with another piece that will fit. You can't just destroy it because if you were to just pull it apart, that's um, tandem to. Uh, being hit with high doses of gamma radiation, where your genetic, uh, where your your nucleotides just get blown to pieces, where your genome just gets blown to pieces, and you get um, genetic freaks basically uh, as a result of that. So you get a dysfunctional human being if you if you destroy the genetics. But if you improve or improve is really not the right word. If you modify the human genome. You can get a functional being that's no longer fully human, that's upgraded, again, according to the transhumanists. Wow. Great stuff, Tim. With that, we're up against the top of the hour break. We're going to take that now. We're going to come back in hour number two with your uh, fellow researcher, Darren. He's going to be joining us with you, and we're going to continue talking about uh, these super soldiers and 
the deception that is happening all across the world right now. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Monday, September 8th, 2014. True. You can't handle the truth. I, I was reminded as well uh, during the break, the article that uh, I had written titled Life as an Investigator is like a box of chocolates. Now, that is uh, actually serves as the first chapter of Xenogenesis, that's Steve Quill's book, but it also is published at uh, homelandsecurityus.com. Just put in the search box, box of chocolates, and you'll read that article, which, again, serves as chapter one of Steve, uh, Steve Quill's book. But the reason I brought that up is what Tim is talking about. The context of that, the, the, um, that incident took place quarter, really about a quarter of a century ago. And I was, when I first presented this to someone, um, I'm not going to get into the detail, but uh, I was told, you know, if you publish this article under your own name or your name, because I don't use a pen name, it's, I write, but I write, I publish under my name, period, that's it, take it or leave it. But I was told, your credibility will take a hit. Well, so be it. Um, after investigating the story, after after understanding exactly what was being said, uh, the silvery nano thread, the parasite type thing of the um, uh, strands of DNA, uh, yeah, I published that. And uh, I, I got to tell you something: uh, did my credibility take a hit? I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, some people can't handle the truth. Some people aren't aren't programmed to handle the truth, as Tim brought up earlier. Tim, I'm going to let you introduce um, yeah, your uh, um, uh, your uh, associate, Darren. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, um, Darren Geisinger is a, is a good friend of mine. We've been doing a lot of investigations together. Um, oftentimes, we'll delve into some of this stuff and, and um, go and investigate on our own and then come and compare notes. And it's been very helpful. We've been able to cover a lot of ground together, <clears throat> together doing like this cooperative investigative procedure. So I wanted to bring Darren on tonight um, because there's uh, a lot of information to cover, a lot of very interesting things that that uh, we've both looked into. And I want to make sure we cover a lot of the uh, – I know we only got two hours left. But um, but anyways, uh, Darren's a, a researcher and a good friend of mine. And uh, I'm, I'm going to want him to jump in in a minute here. I – um, I want to finish a thought here before, because we're going to go in a specific direction when Darren, Darren gets on. But um, I wanted to finish my thought here, and, and, and I apologize uh, to the listening audience tonight. My, 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 I'm so scatterbrained and, and, uh, and, and, and have so much brain fog right now, but this is really important information. I know I'm spitting out a lot of bizarre, uh, seemingly arbitrary information right now. I'll try to slow down and be a little bit more methodical. Um, I want to... Uh, to talk about real quick to, to kind of um, um, give you some context for some of, some of the wilder statements I made previously, which are true, that if you see something like the advanced tool, tools for mammalian genome engineering solicitation pop out in the public, understand that they've already accomplished this under the ground, literally under the ground, um, both literally and metaphorically, under the ground in, in, a, in a military base and metaphorically because it's been hidden away from your eyes. So a good example of this is a particular underground base, which many people have heard about, the underground base uh, in Dulce, uh, the, the Dulce underground base in near Dulce, New Mexico, which is a very famous underground base that uh, many investigators have, investigators have tried to, to prove exists, and it does exist, and there's a lot of corro corroborating information concerning the Dulce base. And the Dulce base, the things that they're doing in the Dulce base are some of the most horrific things um, that you can imagine. Uh, one of the primary um, one of the primary functions of the Dulce base has to do with genetics. At least it did in the 80s. I, I assume that it's still functioning in the same capacity. If not, they've moved it somewhere else. Almost all of these underground bases, by the way, have, are, are working with genetics, among other things. They're, they're very, very interested in genetics, and they've made uh, – let's just put it this way. They can clone human beings at this point. Um, and they can make carbon copies of human beings, and there's a whole there's a whole science behind that, and and we don't have time to break that down. But the reason why I mentioned the Dulce case is the, the Dulce base is because 
there there is a lot of corroborating information to the existence of this base. Steve Quayle often mentions a a U.S. Russian double agent uh, that, that's an intelligence that was an intelligence professional um, uh, with cosmic clearance or something equi- equivalent uh, that he was working with in the that that he was working with in the in the 90s in the late 90s. He was he hired the guy to do some investigation and and uh, because the guy had high clearance. Now this guy actually corroborated the information. Uh, concerning the Dulce base. And the reason why I'm bringing the Dulce base up is because the Dulce base, uh, again, it's in New Mexico. It's, it's uh, supposedly uh, or allegedly under the Archuleta Mesa in, uh, in New Mexico, and it's a very extensive underground base. And supposedly they're doing or allegedly they're doing horrific genetic experimentation. They have been since the early 80s at least. And they have, they've actually uh, have leaked some things from the Dulce base, and and somebody's come out and and, and leaked years back, I think in the 90s, early 90s, <clears throat> that they were able to con- confirm seven levels to this base, and uh, the first three levels are just um, security, human staff housing, executive offices and laboratories. But once you get to four to set, once you get to level four, it starts to get very bizarre, and you have to have very high clearance to get down there because level four allegedly is mind control. Level five is alien housing, the grays, whether you believe that or not. Level six, it was said to be genetic experimentation. They call it the zoo. Level seven was cryogenics and cold storage vats, which was also referred to as nightmare hall for some very, for some very appropriate reasons. So this this Russian U.S. Russian double agent that, that that Steve was in contact with actually was in the Dulce base, and this was uh, he actually corroborated and verified that this base exists and that they are doing genetic experimentation. He was actually in, on the floor level six on the zoo level, the level where they're doing human genetic experimentation. And Steve tells the story often, and and uh, that this hardened Russian. U.S. Russian double agent spy assassin, you know, mafioso guy, broke down like a baby and cried with Steve, explaining, telling him what he saw on the genetic level of the Dulce base and on the genetic experiments level referred to as the zoo. The horrific genetic experimentation that they're doing, uh, crossbreeding humans with, uh, or I should say genetically modifying humans by uh, doing cross-species genetics with all kinds of different animals, and that they were creating these 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 aberrations that were in, that were suffering and crying and crying out for help. And um, it's a very I, I, I can't I can't even wrap my my brain around that, Tim. I mean, as hard as is really as hard as I'm trying, and it's not that I don't believe it. It's I'm trying to envision that, and it, it's difficult to do. You know, and, and folks, I, I mean, I guess that's by design, isn't it? Uh, it's difficult to Absolutely. really, you know, to, to really think about that and, and to that's and right. to envision that. That that is by design, and uh, um, the, the 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 Russian's name, by the way, is William Armstrong, or AKA the Maverick. And uh, so Steve, again, Steve has talked about this extensively on the on the radio. Or he's mentioned it a, a handful of times, at least that I've heard on the radio. And it's a very compelling story to me because I've studied the, the underground base at Dulce, and all the stories that have come out about this underground base have corroborated one another. Um, so here you have a guy who absolutely attested to the fact that it is true that on level six and on level seven of this underground base, underneath the Archuleta Mesa in New Mexico, they're doing the most grotesque, horrific genetic experimentation on human beings. By the way, and I and I and I hate to ruin everybody's evening. I really do. But a lot of these people that are taken into this base are children, and a lot of these young people that go missing. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. They, they're abducted, and I mean, you can imagine the monsters that are that are that are doing these experimentations. I mean, these subhuman monsters um, that are basically children of their father, the devil doing these experimentations on, on children. And, again, I, I hate to be that graphic, but people have to understand the reality. People have to come to terms 
with reality. This is happening. And, um, you know, I have little children myself, and then I look at my little boys, and, and, and I can't, uh, just like you, Doug, I can't imagine. It's almost like there's a, there's a firewall in my brain that just doesn't allow that information to truly compute and sink in because it is so devastating, so horrific. But, folks, that is the world in which we live. That is the depths of evil and wickedness that are, that are, and that's a sort of a pun. It is the depths of evil and wickedness, the wickedness that's happening in the depths. And that brings me to, a, and I'm going to bring Darren on in a minute here into the conversation, but that brings me to a, a, a verse that uh, I came across um, concerning this. I think this is a very interesting verse. It's in Psalm 74, uh, verse 20. And it says, Have respect unto the covenant." For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. I'm going to say that again. Have, this is Psalms 74, verse 20. Have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. And I submit to you that that is literal, that that psalm is speaking to a very literal situation and uh so anyway, it's not my intention to, to gross people out, to gross people out, or to shock people, but this is reality. This shows you the depths of the wickedness behind the occult. That when, I, when we say that these guys are are evil, that's an understatement. There really isn't a word that describes. And of course, we all know that human trafficking happens, and we all know we're all aware of what these men do to the children, the sex slaves that they have. And we're talking baby infants, you know, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. I've seen that, it. That's the level of depravity that we're yeah. dealing with. As an investigator, I've seen some pretty horrific things. Um, and, and, and at the tail end, Joe did too. But um, i got to tell you, uh, it never – I was never, ever – it never stopped amazing me to see the level of depravity another human can inflict on – or a human can put on another human. I just, especially children, babies, um, to, to rape an infant, for example, to, uh, and I won't get into it, but, but folks, trust me, that stuff is real, not that what Tim's saying is not, but just take it a step further or just follow through to the logical conclusion. By the way, Tim, i got to ask you, the people that are doing this six, seven levels down, are there people walking in the sunlight, in the daylight that know this exists? I mean, you, who can I go to and, and grab onto, you know, grab by the be, throat? They, they, say, they, those people have to be uh, uh, programmed. A lot of those guys are going to be Illuminati, Illuminati black awakening type people who have programming and altered personalities and, Okay. And uh, so they so they will retreat. They'll switch off of that of that personality of that uh, of that um, personality. The alter in their mind when they come out of the base, they'll switch to somebody else that doesn't necessarily, you know, they can live a normal life or whatever and, and go on about their business above ground and then go in like anybody else waking up at six a.m. go into work and you know and, and do these kinds of things. And it's it's programming. It has to be a normal sane person couldn't couldn't do it. Oh, uh, I mean, it no. has to be a, a, an extremely wicked, demonic person that is that is completely given over to the occult, and in many cases, programmed. And, and this is, by the way, folks, this is Russ Dizdor territory, or Russ Dizdor, Russ Dizdar territory uh, conference in Chicago. The end of this month, we'll be attending Joe and I. Uh, yep. Uh, yep. Uh, Tim, go ahead. I'll flip it back there. Yep. Are you going to be there, Tim? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think so. Okay. All right. But, um, all right. Okay. I'd like to. Yeah. Uh, this, this is the. I want to. I want to say one more thing here, and then uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Darren. There is a in 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 19 in the 1990s, late 1980s. Um, there was a. I don't know if he's still alive, but there was a Japanese researcher. His name. Let's see if I can say this name without botching. His name is Norio Hayakawa. Some people maybe have heard of him. Um, he was a Japanese. Um, a filmmaker, documentary maker. He was an investigative journalist and, and um, very popular. And he did some really good work. He was on uh, Art Bell's show, Coast to Coast, a handful of times and different shows and wrote different books and interviews. And um, in a letter dated January 28, 
Um, you made some comments concerning the, the Dulce facility, this, this underground base that we're referring to, and um, its possible connection with the mystery of iniquity as, as, in the, uh, as in Bible prophecy. This is what he said. This is a quote from, that, uh, from the comments in the letter. Now listen to this. It's very interesting. I've been to Dulce with the Nippon Television Network crew and interviewed many, many people over there and came back with the firm conviction that something was happening around 10 to 15 years ago over there, including nightly sightings of strange lights and appearances of military jeeps and trucks. And I am convinced that the Four Corners area is a highly occult area. The only stretch of highway, namely Highway 666, runs through the Four Corners area from southeast Arizona to northwestern New Mexico and up and into southwest California. Southwest Colorado and Southeast Utah. I have also heard that this Highway 666 came into existence around 1947 or 1948, fairly close to the time of 1947, the modern day beginning of overt UFO appearance, i.e., the Kenneth Arnold incident, and coincidentally or not, the establishment of Israel in 1948. Now, you have to understand that. Uh, this highway, 666, that was named 666 back in the late 1940s during the, uh, the big UFO flaps and when everything was beginning with the UFOs. Not beginning, but it was really surfacing in the public view. That's when they named this highway, 666, that just so happens to pass through one of the uh, areas in the United States where the most and most important underground bases are located, where the most UFO activity has been reported, where we're developing some of our most powerful weapons and, and, uh, and vehicles. I mean, is it really coincidence that they named that Highway 666, where these genetic experiments are happening, um, again, corroborated by the uh, Russian uh, double agent that, that Steve knew in the, in, the, in, the, in the 90s? There's something very satanic, very Luciferian, very carefully planned out happening in that area of the United States, and it's happening under the ground. And uh, with that, um, I want to bring on, um, uh, uh, kick it over to Darren. Darren's got some interesting things concerning some of the things that we're talking about. Go ahead, Darren. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? We can, yeah. Can you hear me okay? okay. Well, I have some brain fog and throat problems, too, so we'll, we'll make a good team here. Collectively, maybe we can get out some cohesive thoughts, but... Uh, yeah, I, 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 to comment on what Tim's saying is that um, I have been researching and tracking a few things, and I'm just asking the Lord to give me uh, discernment as to what's true and, and what isn't. Because as you as you read and research, you don't know what to believe. But uh, the Lord has just sort of tasked me with tracking a few things that are going on, and a lot of it has to do with underground activities and underground entities and how this fits into what you guys are talking about. And what I'm tracking, I'm not saying that I believe it, but it's, it's, it's alleged and a lot of things are pointing to it that it's true or mostly true is that, again, it goes back to the Nazis and, uh, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, pic, uh, pictorial of how Hitler was combing the globe for every religious and occultic artifact is, is very true. And uh, he searched the, whole, the globe over, and when he came to the Tibetan monks, um, found that they were uh, in, in guard of some uh, secrets uh, and had been known of underground entities for a very long time. And through that, uh, Hitler and his henchmen were able to make contact with some races of underground entities uh, that are known through, throughout the world in legend only uh, as these little stories uh, creep out. But he got to know them much more um, uh, intimately, and that's where the name Vril uh, comes from. It's not just a Vril society, but there's supposedly a race of tall, well, there's a short variety and a medium and, and a tall variety of something called the Vril. And they didn't have technology, from what I'm understanding. Uh, they are very much an instinctual uh, race. And, uh, but they knew of where to find ancient high technology. So in exchange for who knows whatever they exchanged in a deal, uh, this race of Brill uh, gave Hitler and the Nazis uh, high technology. And so that's what we started to see developing towards the end of the war in the, in the flying wings. And, and 
So when Operation Paperclip happened, we all know we've heard that ad nauseum, Operation Paperclip, all those scientists came over. So it wasn't just rocket technology. It wasn't this. They also, I believe, um, turned uh, a lot of people on to under, hidden underground uh, races or entities. So when the drilling, I know a lot of people that research this might think that they're alien and that uh, when we were building our bases, somehow they took over these bases and we had to, well, we were in a cooperation and maybe they took, no, I think they were at the deepest levels underground and there was no way to go down there without making uh, deals with them. And uh, that's, I'm convinced, speaking of Phil Schneider, that when he describes when he was lowered down, uh, and you guys will have to, anybody who doesn't know the Phil Schneider story, you'll have to go online and, and, and listen to him, but he describes uh, drilling deeply underground and then going down there to find out what the trouble was because their equipment was getting smashed, and he came face-to-face with the tall grays, which are these very tall, six, seven, eight-foot-tall uh, entities with long necks and, and, and dark eyes, and uh, they smell horribly, and he actually was able to shoot one of them, and they blew off part of his hand and fried him and killed a lot of good men that day. But I'm convinced that the entity that he ran into was something known as the Vril Type 3. It's, uh, it's, a, tall, it's a tall gray, and um, they are a subterranean species, and they are not at all uh, alien in any way. They're only alien to us. That's what That's I'm right. seeing. Yeah. Now, would I be shocked to find out that they, they do have, you know, interstellar travel or something like that? I wouldn't be shocked. But go ahead, Tim, what were you going to say? No, uh, this is Joe, Joe Darren. Oh. And I just wanted to say one of the uh, in one of his speeches, he said uh, that the alien agenda and uh, demons were one and the same. And uh, I believe that was after the experience you were talking about. When you say the yeah. alien... You're you're saying the greys and the fallen for the demons. What, what are you saying? They are the same. The the, the greys. Yeah, he and was the, saying the, he said the uh, alien. Uh, I forget exactly how he how it was quoted or how he worded it, but the alien deception and uh, demons, aliens and demons were were the same thing, and there was a deception. Yes, it was it was it was demonic. Yep. Yeah, he absolutely attested to that. But, I will say that uh, that I think that they led Phil Schneider or others to believe that with their high technology, that they might have been interplanetary or intergalactic, and I don't I don't think they are at all. I think that they have access to high technology, to vehicles that can uh, zip in and out dimensionally, and and possibly there's many many entities that do, but I don't believe they give the illusion. If I was if if I was Phil Schneider, too, I think I would believe in looking at them. They're definitely aliens. Who would believe that there's there's underground uh, races that we don't know about? It seems completely preposterous. Uh, so I see why he would believe that they they are alien. Um, but, no, I – and yeah, – Let you me, know, you let guys me also – Go ahead. I was going to say, let me, let, let me, let me uh, extrapolate on the on the Nazi connection here. Because this does directly have to do with the with the theme super soldiers, and I'll tell you why. The Vril, um, the Vril was a very big. It was a, it was a um, this idea of these entities that that they're referring to. They were in contact with, according to the Vril Society, the Nazis and the Thule Society. They were in contact with these entities. They believed in this in this race that lived under the ground, as do most uh, civilizations around the world, ancient civil, civilizations around the world. And there was actually a book called Vril, the Power of the Coming Race, that was uh, a novel written in 1871 uh, by Edward Buller Lytton. And and that he was an occult. He was a guy that was steeped in the occult. I think he was a Rosicrucian. And uh, I mentioned before that the Vril Society made contact with entities that gave them schematics. They gave them schematics, working schematics, for craft. Now, and, and of course, ultimately all that uh, technology ended up where, it's, where it is still today, under the ice in Antarctica, in, in, the, in the underground bases in Antarctica. But here's the deal. This race, um, remember what the Nazis were trying to do, one of the primary things that the Nazis were trying to do, create super soldiers. That was... That was um, really, that was that was Hitler's end all 
was to create this master race, the Aryan race, which everybody is familiar with. But what most people don't understand is that when Hitler wanted to create the master race, he wasn't looking ahead, he was looking behind. In other words, he was trying to bring out the genetics, to refine the genetics that he believed were already in his people from the Atlanteans, from the great Aryan civilizations. So basically these entities that they had got in contact through, through the occult, which we talked about in a prior show, it enabled them to do what they wanted to do. They made huge leaps and bounds in genetic technology, another thing a lot of people don't know about the Nazis. Now, these experiments that, like, uh, Joseph Mengele was, was doing and, and, and the different uh, Nazi scientists understand that a lot of those scientists were brought over to the United States in Project Paperclip and began to work, continue their work in their respective fields. The geneticists continued to work, to do their genetic experimentation. So all of this technology that was fueled by the cult and by these entities that, uh, that Darren's referring to, which they are demonic entities, they're very nefarious, evil entities, fallen entities that were giving this schematics and the technology and driving the impetus behind all this came over to the United States. So I just wanted to make that connection that, that, that the same uh, forces that were at work in World War II um, with the Nazis are still at work in the world. They're just below ground. They're, half, right. they're functioning behind the scenes. And, the, and you know, there's the legend that uh, these, uh, the seances or whatever, were pulling up these schematics uh, from, from just uh, concentration or from, I don't know how tel telepathic means, but uh, what if, personally, I'm just postulating that could be a cover story in which if this other uh, line of thinking is true, that the Vril Society was in contact with the actual race of the Vril who knew, and, and you said the word Atlantean, I wanted to say it before, but I said so many crazy things, I didn't want to throw the word Atlantean in it, but that's supposedly the technology they knew of. They didn't want to possess it. They, they're supposedly the Vril don't uh, take that much part in it, but they knew where to get it. So they gave that, uh, the Atlantean technology to Hitler, and as you were saying, he believed they were from the master race, or maybe perhaps once they got in contact with some of these entities, they told them that they were, and they could help them perfect their genetics. And so, as Tim was saying, when they came over to the United States and you start drilling all these deep underground military bases, and those same German scientists are over here, and they're in those bases doing research, you say, well, excuse me, we're going to have a meeting now, and I'm going to introduce you to some entities, and uh, here they are. And so when they walk in the room, in fact, Phil Schneider talks, and Tim, you could probably tell the story, Phil Schneider talks about being in a meeting in which uh, non-human entities entered, and a whole host of uh, underground uh, engineers left and literally quit and tried to walk off the job when non-human entity entities entered the room. Well, I believe in it was yeah. Yeah, in an underground ahead. in an underground base that belonged to the UN. That was a he said it was a model of what's built in New York, but under the ground. And if I want to, you know, I want to tie some of other things that we talked about together. You guys were uh, talking before about uh, how they make it unbelievable. The people that don't want the truth out. Well, you know, you just said, well, if there's one real picture on the Internet, why don't you flood the Internet with 50 fake ones that no one believes? It's all ridiculous. You mentioned it at the water cooler at work. You're going to get laughed at. Well, how about these Vril, the type 3s, the females, are in a movie? They're actually portrayed quite kindly in a movie, and uh, it makes it very much unbelievable. So I'm not sure if I should mention the movie here, but... It's yeah, go ahead. Star well, it's a Star Wars movie, and if you... If you Google uh, Kaminoans or whatever, it was the tall uh, gray-like entities with the wide-set eyes that were in charge of the cloning centers and producing the uh, clone armies. Uh, that is supposedly what a female Vril Type 3 looks like exactly. Not a little bit. The person that has seen these entities, I'm not going to give this person's name right now, but this person has had a lot of interaction with these entities uh, that I've been tracking says that the Kaminoans, if you just look up Star Wars clones, uh, K-A-M-I-N-O-A-N-S, that is supposedly exactly what a female Vril Type 3 looks like. And the, the females are much more kindly looking than the scary males. But anyway, to stay on task with their point, if you put that in a movie, 
now, if that ever comes out and someone ever claims it to be true before the elite wants it to be known, you're going to be laughed, you know, out of the room. Of course, something from Star Wars can't possibly be real, but supposedly that's exactly what they look like. And so whoever made that movie, and I think we know some of the people who did make that movie know all about them. So I just want to say, well, so, go ahead. I was just going to try to bring it back to super soldiers. So we didn't. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Well, well, we have Captain America and we have all these superheroes and, and these are genetic, uh, these are genetically modified beings in most of the cases, these are genetically modified beings. And people, if you, if you present this, information to people in the form of Captain America, how do they react? Well, that's science zero. fiction. It's a, it's that's zero. ridiculous. Yeah. They don't have a context for this, uh, for this technology in reality, and it's purposely so. They want you to think about genetics and, and, and super soldiers and, and um, um, nanotechnology and robotics. They want all of these ideas in your brain to be associated with movies. Because movies aren't real. Because movies are fictional. It's Hollywood. That's how they want you to look at this. So that's uh, that's part of the programming. When in well, reality, Tim, 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 just take the to take the Avengers. You bring up a really good point. I didn't want to stop. You're on you're on a tear there. But if you take uh, you know uh, Iron Man is is uh, is a, is a cybernetically enhanced uh, being. Thor says he's a god. Okay. And uh, he, he often says things that are very, we could get into Thor all on its own. That's a whole conversation. But then you've got the Hulk that's uh, genetically modified, and then you've got Captain America, the super soldier. So how about that? And they battle really, really evil things that we hate and save us all. Aliens and many I like the Avengers. Well, of course, but I like the Avengers, of course. That was a great movie. I mean, whoever did it, top of their game. I love Iron Man and all that stuff. But, boy, is it coincidental that it's everything that they want to push and they are they are softening our hearts to all of those subjects. Notice that's yeah. British as well, the Avengers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, right. And, and I do think that there's um, there, there there's a reason for that, but uh, that's that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, and people, of course, I can just imagine the perhaps thousands of people rolling their eyes. But let me tell you something: DARPA has actually proposed on paper creating super soldiers with the very capabilities in some cases, especially uh, Captain America, that you see in the movies. I mean, this isn't something that, you know, we're pulling out of our rear ends. This is the Defense Department. These are Pentagon-initiated projects. They want to have uh, cybernetic soldiers. They talk about it in the daylight. Again, if they're talking about it in the daylight, then they've already done it beneath the ground. So... They want to have technology integrated into the human body so that they can, uh, I mean, imagine if they can produce human beings that have night vision capabilities because they have some kind of apparatus um, that's been installed into their eye socket. That, that, that would be a capability that would allow soldiers to be able to access night vision, for example, without having to have an external piece of equipment. That's something that DARPA would love to be able to do or to be able I to I think they can already do it. I think they can too, or to be able to interface directly into the brains of their soldiers. Or, to, the, by the way, telepathic communication between soldiers, that is a DARPA project. That's not Tim and Darren, uh, you know, blowing smoke. That's a DARPA project. They want soldiers to be able to, to communicate quietly, telepathically. It's going to start off as a helmet and your brain interfaces with it. And, and, you know, obviously people can imagine where this is going. They're going to put chips in your brain. They're going to chip your cerebral cortex uh, um, uh, Ray Kurzweil goes all around the nation talking about this stuff openly. He works for Google. He's one of the execs at Google now. This isn't stuff that they're kind of wondering if they're going to do. This is stuff that they've already done in many circumstances and projects that are already on the table. You want to run faster. You want to be strong. You'll be able to carry hundreds of pounds of weight. And we're not just talking about exoskeletons. We're talking about genetics. That's where this is really going is in genetics, but also the cybernetics, the cyborgs. And, and, and there again, the term cyborg, almost everybody listening to this conversation is going to, who are familiar with Star Trek, is going to picture the Borg, the, the, the Borg from Star Trek. Where, but you know what? Let me tell you something. That's very accurate imagery to what DARPA wants. They want soldiers that are interfacing with their system that they can control. We know that the government has already done MKUltra. 
the CIA has already done MKUltra, already done the Monarch Project. They're working with mind control all the time. Well, why do you work with mind control? Because you want to control minds. That in and of itself should make people worry. The government is very interested in controlling the minds of their soldiers. They don't want soldiers on the battlefield to be inhibited by uh, – they don't want them to have moral impediments. They want killing machines. And, Tim, we should mention, you know, uh, Steve Quayle's book, Xenogenesis, one more time, and say that if anybody is listening to this program right now and does not have that book, go to stevequayle.com and get Xenogenesis, Making Men into Monsters. Because it, 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 Tim and I were talking earlier today, and you, you ranted that that book contains everything about this. This is everything you need yeah, to know is in that book. Really so comes- get, yeah, you you got to get that book. I was just thinking, too, that um, as as what I believe was happening, too, with the underground bases and uh, introducing them to these other entities that had access to technologies that we didn't. So there's a host of projects going on from uh, anti-gravity to cloaking to all, all the military technology. But there was also what we, you and I, Tim, have talked about cloning, which we won't get into it too much, but... I have reason to believe that cloning technology is scarily advanced beyond our wildest imagination. And I believe that just as in the Garden of Eden, when uh, this entity appeared to Eve and said, with the lie, uh, you surely will not die, I do also think that underground or whatever these meetings produced when the scientists that were in the know introduced American scientists, and perhaps it was going around the world all simultaneously, that these entities offered modern man the same type of lie, and we took it all over again. That Absolutely. Through, through cloning, through genetic engineering, you will surely not die. You'll be, your eyes will be open, and you'll become like gods. And I think that a lot of the elite became addicted to this idea that through genetic engineering, through cloning technology, they could jump body to body, consciousness transfers, and some other very uh, hard to imagine the technologies that they would cheat death. I think that they think they're on the cusp of doing it. They're not quite there, but uh, they're in the mad race to do so. And uh, I think it's going to cost uh, that you know mankind just as much as it cost the first time we fell for the lie. Yeah, that is a primary. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, uh, yeah, Tim, if I could just interject something here. Um, you had mentioned cloning before, and before I forget, on the May 2nd, uh, 2014 broadcast of this show, we had uh, our intelligence insider telling a great story about cloning and about the cloning of a dog. Uh, folks, go back and listen to the May 2nd, 2014 episode of the Hagman and Hagman Report, and this will all begin to make sense. And also, uh, prior to uh, uh, that as well, uh, or in conjunction with that, uh, Paul McGuire talks about Hyperborea, the Nazis, the real uh, real, uh, um, uh, race, if you will, Mm -hmm. Hitler and all this. So this is all fitting together. I I, I just, folks, if you follow this program for any length of time, Mr. Alberino and, and now Darren are adding very critical pieces to this puzzle. That's all I really want to say. Go ahead, Tim. Well, I was, well before Tim jumps in, I'm just still happening to be staring at on my computer in front of me that the, the Star Wars Kaminoans that supposedly is this, this female Vril that is one, just one of probably many entities that they, but as Phil Schneider saw, I believe it's the Tall Grays, that, it is, that this is the race that they put in the movie that's in charge of the cloning factory. I mean, I guess if there's no more way to make it ridiculous and obvious and tell us exactly what they're doing, if this is one of the entities that pointed to this technology and then they put in the movie that that is the thing in charge of the, the cloning, I just, I don't know what to say. No, I probably couldn't tell it to anybody on the street and with them keeping a straight face. It's a perfect cover for for keeping it in the ridiculous and out of out of like what Tim said, the average American would couldn't couldn't grasp. Tim is is and well, uh, sorry about jumping in here, but is that like um, you're standing in the line of the grocery store and you see the National Enquirer or, or back in the day the Tattler, I think it was, or 
one of these uh, tabloids, and of course you've got this alien shaking hands with uh, with whoever pr- the president was at the time, Nixon or Elvis or you know something. Who knows? I, I mean, is is this a kind of uh, a programming or uh, the yeah, mental those, saturation? Those, Go ahead. Those are fa- those are all fake. Those images, right? But they're, they're trying to make light of. Um, or intentionally cover up by making it ridiculous of a very serious situation. Let, let me let me um, direct this conversation towards something I think is, is it will help people understand uh, how this could be so. Because I know this is a this is a very difficult pill for a lot of people to swallow. It was for me, and any sane person is going to have a hard time digesting this stuff because it is so absolutely bizarre. But um, there's there's a ufologist, a, a, a very um, a very well researched, does great work uh, ufologist named Richard Dolan, and Richard Dolan um, uh, has done extensive investigation into all of this. By the way, he, he there's an interview online. I I maybe maybe uh, uh, Darren, if you have access to YouTube right now, there's an in- interview online. I don't know the title of it, where he actually interviews a, a somebody that worked with. Project Blue Book. I can't remember his name, but he he was sworn to silence for 50 years. But after the the the, the time of his silence expired, um, he spoke out. Um, one of the reasons is because he was about to die. He had some kind of a disease. I can't remember what it was, but he was on his deathbed, and uh, it just so happened that his his period of silence was was uh, his agreement was expiring, and so before he died, he came out and spilled the beans and uh, spilled the beans on a lot of stuff, Area 51 stuff. And so this isn't just kook stuff. This is well-documented, high-level people coming and talking about this stuff. And anyway, referring to Richard Dolan, Richard has a, uh, has a term that he coined. He calls it breakaway civilization. I referred to that earlier. It's very important to understand breakaway civilization because if you can understand breakaway civilization, it gives you the context uh, to place everything that we're talking about tonight. A breakaway civilization basically refers to a society or a group of people within a society that have access to high technology, technology that is uh, more advanced than what the general public is using. What happens is if there is a policy of silence to cap that technology so that the public doesn't know about it, where you just trickle down little bits and pieces so that we're not stuck in the Stone Age forever, uh, so that society can, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like handing out little pieces of candy, so that society can be happy with their iPhones and with their uh, high tech gadgets and their movies and their Facebook and their, you know, uh, so to keep everybody happy. But in the background, you're advancing hundreds of years with technologies that that in reality could absolutely transform society and be very beneficial to society. But uh, that is what what is happening behind the scenes. Different factions, it's not one solid faction. It's different factions are working with technologies that are vastly beyond what we're using in the, uh, in the, in the public world. Uh, technologies that, that, again, are, are akin to Star Wars and to Star Trek. And so if you have maniacal individuals in the background, uh, unsavory individuals working with high technology, uh, individuals who would love to reduce the, the population of the earth to 500 million people um, and would love to would love for their genetically engineered Ebola virus to, to be killing 10 times the amount of people it's killing right now. When you have people like that who are in control of this technology, listen, they're living in a different world than you. They're, 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 they're living in a completely different reality than you are. They're working with technology. They're working with cloning technology, life extension technology, weapons, um, aeronomical vehicles. They're working with bases that are located off planet. They have uh, craft that's like aircraft carriers that, that orbits around the Earth, and they've got all kind of vehicles that they fly in and out. This is a breakaway society, using Richard Nolan's term. This is a society that is now developing apart from the human race. It's like uh, if we, from the 21st century, were to go back in time with all of our technology and begin to live uh, on an island at the same time that, uh, you know, the people from the B.C. era are walking around, you know, in animal skins and sandals. It's two, 
two uh, societies that are both human societies that are living on the same planet, but one of the societies societies is working with technology that's vastly superior to the other. In fact, the other society, even though they're both human living on the same planet, can't even comprehend at this point the technology that's being used, that's being deployed, and in many cases deployed against them. They can't even comprehend it. People cannot even comprehend that the government openly at this point in time has the technology to project audible voices into your bedroom. And, and folks, this is well known. I can't give you the document right now. Google it and, and, and do the research yourself. It's well known. They can project audible voices into your bedroom. And it's guys that are working with the equipment. They can pretend they're God. I mean, imagine this is godlike power that these people have. And, and the problem is, that these are not benevolent human beings that are in charge of this technology. In most cases, these are people, and I, and I always harp on this because it, it, it's, it's, it's the root of evil and not just the fruit of evil like Steve always talks about. These are people who are steeped in the occult. These are people who have, uh, who have sworn oaths to, to, to Satan and to the coming one, referring to the Antichrist. These are the people who are orchestrating the New World Order and, and who are behind the Illuminati. They they have a breakaway civilization. They have a breakaway civilization that is fully operational. That's what uh, um, uh, the kind of stuff that Darren's referring to. They've got cloning technology. They've got life extension technology. They've got technology that allows them to, to uh, traverse the earth in, in the blink of an eye. And as fantastic as that may seem, just think about it logically. If it's true that this, that, that these people had access to technology, let's say that was 10 years in advance to what we had. After World War II, they did. It was called the Nazis. They did have that technology, documented fact. They were at least 10 years ahead of everybody else with the technology. And that's very conservative. There were way more. They didn't have it all fully developed by the time the war came to a conclusion. That's why they went to Antarctica. So just take the Nazis. If they were, let's say, 10 years advanced, we bring those guys over here, we don't tell anybody about the technology they were working on, and we begin to develop it with taxpayer money and then ultimately black budget money. Isn't it logical to infer that there would be in the background, just like Richard Dolan uh, postulates, a breakaway society that is working with advanced technology that obviously we don't have in the public realm, in the public and form? And then add on, Tim, add on to that got in contact with entities that we can hardly imagine, so that was with the knowledge of the scientists, and then you add on to it a whole host of entities that wanted to begin the process of the great deception, and you, 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 you fast forward to well, there was there were studies, and I was, I was researching showing that part of the Montauk experiments were uh, sending out uh, telepathic messages over the whole northeast of the country, and they actually had over just a phone number. They were broadcasting a phone number in the 1960s, and over 600 people called that number. Yep. So you're talking about just sending That's out documented. a telepathic – Yeah, and having 600 people say, I'm calling this number that's in my head – the 60s, we're now at 2014, so you can only imagine right. exactly where the technology is, is, has gone from there. And Tim, I wanted to also say that I, um, I pulled up on the computer, uh, if you Google deathbed confession of former CIA agent, you're going to see a very credible inter short interview with a person who isn't in great health, but obviously is telling the truth about his uh, experience in Project Blue Book and how him and his boss uh, under orders of uh, President Eisenhower, went and uh, needed to go into some of these secret bases and get the truth right now, where Eisenhower was going to uh, take the base uh, by force if they didn't tell him what was going on. And the guy didn't get to, but his boss got to talk to an quote-unquote alien. Well, if you see, you know, some of these entities that we're talking about, let's put it all together with what Steve Quayle and Tom Horn and some of the other people that come on this program are very good at describing is that the L.A. Marzulli, the coming great deception. So you, these people are ushered into a room with an entity like this. Of course you're going to think it's an alien, and that's exactly what they want them to, to believe. And they're known to be great liars. You could even tell they were liars. And so you can't believe what they say, but they're coming from intergalactic. They're from uh, this star system or that. And, and really, all along, it is nothing like that. The technology that are, that are getting is local, 
ancient high-tech, Atlantean high technology, and it's beginning the great deception to make everyone believe that uh, the star saviors are coming and that there's all this intergalactic activity when and Heineck and even Tesla, their intellects, the more they dug into it, the more they came to the conclusion that it was not intergalactic, it's local. Uh, and, and that's what people can, the more you dig, the more you realize this is not intergalactic. This is from here, and it's made to look intergalactic for a reason. Did I lose everybody? No. No, that's, that, oh. no, that, that's a good point, because the, the origin of this is the, what people refer to as angel tech. Obviously, this goes back to uh, fallen angels. Uh, this gets traced back to, ultimately, to, to Lucifer. And uh, that's not just the opinion of Christians. Understand that that's the opinion of Luciferians. That's the opinion of people who are operating in the highest levels of government and in media. These people, uh, they, they not only believe in the occult, they not only believe in angels and demons, they believe in Jesus. They understand that they're working against the gospel, by the way. They understand that because they believe that Lucifer is going to give them a part in the coming kingdom, the kingdom that, that they're very convinced that he's about to inaugurate on the earth. And they, they're under the delusion that he will share power with them. But uh, woe to those who get in bed with the father of lies because they're going to get back there. But the, 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 the issue is that behind all of this, if you want to really wrap your head around this, you have to go back to the roots. You have to go back to Genesis, to the fall, all the way back to the garden, and understand that when the devil offered Eve, that she could be as, as the gods or as gods. What was it that he was referring to? Knowledge. And this wasn't just esoteric, new agey, worthless knowledge. This was functional knowledge. If he told the truth in, in anything in that scenario, referring to the devil, the knowledge that he was going to offer her and that he was offering to her was real. It was real knowledge. It wasn't a ruse in the sense that, there, that nothing happened. And, no, this is the fruit of what happened back in those roots in the Garden of Eden. What we see now, that knowledge, that forbidden knowledge is playing out. It's, it's coming to a close. It's going full circle back to the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is, the, this is the kind of knowledge that basically the human race has been paying the price for throughout all of history. I mean, we, 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 we invent uh, weapons of war, we improve weapons of war, and what do we get as a result? We get more dead human beings. I mean, this is the, the, the ebb and flow of human culture. It's the apple. It's the, by the way, I don't think it was an apple, but it's, it's what was offered to Eve. It's Luciferianism, Luciferianism and it, it, it is at the heart of every single issue. It's well, at Tim, the heart of the can, um, Tim, maybe next, the next, I know we're coming up to the close of the hour here, but we can get into something about how the super soldiers, all this high tech is leading to the great deception because um, I believe the great deception is already here and taken a hold in the elite. There's a, a vast, and you said it was the breakaway society. They've embraced the great deception already. They're, they are, are fully taken a hold of it, uh, probably couldn't escape if they want to, unless it probably cost them their lives. But um, So they're just waiting to expose the great deception on the masses, and that's why they're not in a rush, because they know how much is in the balance. What it's, it is, it's, it's all the human souls. It's it is, the, it is the great chess match that's going on, and they have to unfold it in just the right way, lest uh, the feisty human spirit uh, be roused uh, before it's time and, and we fight back in ways they are not comfortable with. So it's well documented on the show. They are luring us to sleep and, and, and slowly taking away our, our claws and our teeth to the point when they spring the great deception it's just it's going to be embraced by the masses and it's just not time yet but it's coming and the elite the elite have already taken a hold of the great deception they've, they've already fallen for it and they're just waiting to spring it on the rest of us yeah and they're going to spring it during a time of great cataclysm and there is a cataclysm coming there's a both a geological 
and a financially engineered cataclysm coming. And it will be unlike anything the earth has ever seen. The Bible actually talks about the earth wobbling to and fro like a drunkard. Now that, uh, that, that prophetic snippet from the Psalms is actually, actually I don't think it's the Psalms, it's one of the prophets, actually is corroborated for whatever it's worth in the occult world and in the, and in, and in the, uh, the, the prophet, the, the, um, the, the Delphic oracle and, and the different occultic prophets and prophetesses uh, that were divining from demons, but they were also seeing in the future some great cataclysm that was coming to the earth that would literally cause the earth to something to change in the geological structure of the earth. So there's something coming that they know is coming. They're preparing the deception, and when it happens, that's the point at which they're going to unleash the, the, the deception on the masses. When we're calling out, as the Bible says in the book of Revelations, for peace and safety because of the chaos. Absolutely. That's a great place to take a break. We're at the top of the hour. We'll be right back with uh, Timothy Alberino and his friend and, and researcher, Darren, after these short messages. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Monday, September 9th, 2014. On this Monday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report, our guests are Timothy Alberino. His book is The Alberino Analysis, found off stevequail.com. And Darren, Darren, is it okay if we use your last name? Yeah. Geisinger, yeah. And do you have a website? Can you hear me okay? Uh, no, yeah, I don't. Can. I don't have a website right now. Just yeah, just uh, yeah. Support SteveCoyle dot com and 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 click the, the Alberino analysis there. That's that's. Yeah, I'm just supporting them too right now. Fantastic. Well, well, both of you make a wonderful research co-op, if you will. Uh, Tim, I'm blown away by the information that you're that you're providing. Darren, you as well. Both of you. That's the Alberino analysis. Uh, the link to the uh, YouTube channel is off of Steve Quell's website, stevequell.com. Uh, Tim, I'm going to turn it. We're going to turn it over to you directly. You go ahead and take us where we need to go. We've got uh, about 50 minutes, five zero minutes left of the program. So let's let's rock and roll here. Okay. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what Darren referred to. The, the deception that's coming because you can imagine I think people may be the ones that aren't uh, the ones who don't think that we're absolutely out of our minds at this point can begin to understand how deceptive the deception how potentially deceptive the deception is actually going to be I mean imagine if you don't even know about the stuff that's going on beneath your feet if you don't even know about the stuff that's going on above your head that human beings are involved in imagine the level of deception that's coming to the planet. I mean, they've got, at this point in time, they've got um, uh, projects that they've been working on. Um, for example, at uh, Los Alamos, the uh, U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, they've been working on uh, research, holographic research, and parapsychology research, and, and the whole idea is to, to be able to uh, control the, the human mind and to project... Um, to project what they want, to project the perspective that they want into the minds of the of the American people and of the human race. And they do have the technology to do that. They have holographic technology at this point that, um, you know, okay, the only thing that we can really reference is, is for example, Star Trek. I mean, the, everybody remembers the, the holodeck in Star Trek. They've got technology equivalent to that at this point. Maybe not to that exact level, but but they've got. It's to the point where it can fool you if you were talking to a hologram. Let's just put it that way. And uh, um, just imagine, just begin to put the pieces together from everything we're talking about: the genetics, the super soldiers, the breakaway civilization. What they could be crafting behind the scenes to deceive everybody. I mean, they could virtually do anything they wanted at this point. They could make the masses believe anything that they wanted at this point starts to give you an idea of why they're so concerned with dumbing uh, with dumbing all of us down it's all part of the same agenda though many different factions are involved at the at the echelon of this thing at the at the very top level of this ladder is is satan the father of lies that's what the game's all about is deception and i've made that comment many times because it is it is what it's all about is deception it is deception that's what their agenda is that's what's unfolding and uh, and I and also, it's important for people to understand too that yes, I've done investigation into this stuff. 
Um, but again, I, I, I told the story, and I won't tell it again here, but uh, I forget what show it was uh, with, with you guys, Doug and Joe, that I, I told the story of when I actually was a firsthand eyewitness of the technolo- some of the technology that I talked about tonight, that I referenced tonight. I actually have seen this technology, and I'm not talking about some bleep in the sky or some some bright light that I saw that was 10 miles away or something like that or, or hearsay or something that could have been something. I'm talking about 50 feet above my head descending over the car. I was sitting and looking up at it with a witness sitting in the passenger seat of the car. Both of our jaws just dropped to the floor watching this vehicle that made no sound whatsoever, had no visible propulsion system, no propellers, uh, absol- like I said, absolutely silent. Folks, what we're dealing with here is a breakaway civilization. That's what we're dealing with. This is a this is technology that uh, is vastly superior to what you see flying around uh, in the skies of Afghanistan or, or in Iraq uh, when you watch the news. This is vastly, vastly superior stuff. And, again, we have to highlight the, the, the word deception at the end of the broadcast here because they're going to take all of this stuff that most people have no clue about and aren't even willing to accept that it, that it could possibly exist, and they're going to turn it on us in the form of a deception. They're already doing it. And, Tim, and, uh, I, would just, I would say uh, that, you know, as fantastical and it's hard to imagine uh, about all the high technology that you yourself witnessed and talking about, you know, the triangular shaped craft that can cloak and, and go interplanetary and uh, that it's, eight, I think it's 83 or 89% anti-gravitic. Uh, that was, excuse me, that was probably old technology. They probably have full anti-gravity now. That it's, we must understand, though, that, that that is still being controlled by the evil one. By They are the pawns and still being controlled by technology that's way above that. Um, because if you go back to the visions of Fatima or Fatima, I've heard it pronounced two different ways, the Tom, Tom Horn definitely uh, in his great book, Exo Vaticana, talks about uh, Fatima and the vision there were of a silver disc that looked like the sun that came down out of the sky and spun and gave off rainbow light uh, and uh, was witnessed by thousands of people, and um, that what was what was happening there was long before uh, the U.S. and and, and the, the people that we're talking about got their hands on this high technology. So who were they? What was going on then? And let's let's carry this thought through. If that was happening and they were testing that on us, what was the reaction of people? Well, it was a highly spiritual reaction. People were crying out it was the end of the world. They were repenting to God. A lot of people got closer to God through that through that experience. And I think what the, the entities, the, the deception was rolling then, and what they needed to do was uh, change our perception and reaction to not turning towards God when we see something like that, but believing that there's a higher intelligence that which must be obeyed. So if you were to take that same type of a mass sighting right now and people were to see a large silver disc coming in and out of the sky and down along a group of people, I think that the reaction would not be repentance. It would not be uh, turning towards God. I would be, and I've heard people say this myself firsthand, I always knew we came from aliens. I literally, that's a quote I, I heard on a fishing trip not that long ago from a grown man that is just, just watched too much History Channel. I always knew we came from aliens, and I think that that was part of the great deception, that they have been carefully fostering a reaction, uh, you know, through all of the sightings, through the Roswell and other crashes, to craft man's reaction uh, to think of, oh, there's, there's a superior intergalactic force that's been watching us all along, and, boy, they must be really, really uh, a lot more advanced than we are, which, it's, as, as I think we can get into this hour, it's not a, I don't believe that it's all intergalactic and, and an ancient alien uh, race that seeded us here. I believe it is the great deception, and they are exactly uh, instituting this lie among men that, uh, and, and, and Ridley Scott's Prometheus movie was, was exactly, Exactly that, that we were seeded here by ancient aliens, that we're, our DNA came from them. And I think that I'm a huge alien uh, fan of 
this, of the series Alien and, and, and somewhat I always appreciated Ridley Scott's um, as artistic uh, work and he's a great director in, world, in worldly terms. And so I was tracking uh, Prometheus coming very closely and I was waiting because I knew the plot lines that they were going to use that were way before Prometheus came out and, and what plot lines they were going to use. And I specifically remember reading an interview where Ridley Scott said, uh, yes, I was going to do that. I was going to make a prequel to Alien and I was going to do this, this, and this storyline, which was much more conventional. And someone came along, he said, that had such an extraordinary, and you guys can look this up. You can Google this for yourself. Someone came along that had such an extraordinary idea, I couldn't resist it. He was going to make a prequel to Alien that was going to be a much more conventional sci-fi movie, and someone came along and swayed him to make the, uh, the engineers or whatever human-looking and that their DNA uh, seeded our planet. It's the panspermia uh, lie. And, uh, and right now, if I am not uh, rambling on too much, they are uh, coming up to a crescendo uh, to really have most reaction across the board that we've come, we must have come from a, a higher intelligence source, and uh, it, it's whoever comes on the scene, and they're going to wait for just the right time. And as Tim said, in a great catastrophe where we are on our knees already begging for, for relief, and, and that's when they'll, they'll come on, and they'll make sense in a whole host of ways, and I think they're going to do away with some evil baddies just like in Avengers, how the, uh, the godlike uh, people save humanity from very ugly, very, very nasty enemies. I think they'll do that in front of everyone. They could possibly be stopping disease. They could be uh, helping us with nuclear reactors that are uh, leaking everywhere or nuclear bombs that have gone off. They could uh, stop certain diseases or pandemics and, and defeat these baddies right in front of everybody these eyes and turn the lights back on and start food flowing again. And what, how do you think the great deception is going to be so great? Who is not going to believe that? They're going to, you're going to see your salvation right before your eyes. And, 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 and they're going to have the explanation that, uh, that we come from them and our genetics. Uh, I, I'll, I'll turn it right back over to Tim in a second. Our genetics are actually corrupted. They, they originally, when they made us, uh, it was going to be much better than this, but over over all this time, it's been corrupted, and now they need to tweak it back for us. They can make it right, and uh, it's a mix of this and a mix of that. And if you just if you just take this genetic upgrade or this mark, then uh, you're going to uh, be in with everybody and be part of uh, humanity 2.0, which we were meant to be all along, which was godlike, which is the lie that uh, the entity told Eve in the garden. So. Yeah, here's the apple all over again. But it's taking a it's taking in our our human terms a long time uh, since World War II and the Nazis to get from there to 2014, and who knows when this is going to start to really break wide open. To to us, it's taking uh, seemingly forever. But to these entities that are in control of of Fatima and uh, Roswell and and whoever else is carefully pulling the strings, they're outside of time. They're timeless. They're not in a rush. They want all of the human souls. They want. They know exactly the plan that they're, they're they want to unfold, and it has to be to exactness. And they're not going to do it a moment too soon. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, it's important to uh, for people to realize that um, at the end of all this, in the Book of Revelations, in the midst of of everything that's happening, the people are going to be clamoring for peace and safety. In fact, that's what they're going to be saying: peace and safety. They'll probably be clamoring clamoring for it in the beginning and then when 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 these entities, these saviors come and bring stability back to the planet uh and right all the wrongs that are going on, that's going to be their banner, peace and safety. It's this what it's going to be allegedly all about is peace and safety. It's not going to be just some horrific scene. It is going to be a horrific scene, but when the ultimate deception unfolds uh, you have to think of it unfolding not as an ugly, demonic thing, but as Lucifer, the angel of light, the very appealing, the very wise um, uh, light bringer, the, the enlightener of humanity, because that's what, the, that's what Luciferianism is. They believe that, 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 that the God of the Jews, the God of the Christians, Adonai, is the tyrant, and that, Luci that Lucifer, they view Lucifer um, they, they, uh, as Prometheus, they view Lucifer 
as Prometheus, as the bringer of technology, the bringer of enlightenment. That is precisely the way that he is going to portray himself at the end. And um, this is something that um, uh, that occurred to me. Um, there's something that occurred to me that I'll try and break down as quickly as possible here uh, in the midst of my brain fog. But there's something that occurred to me when I was watching a documentary, and I, and I sent this over to Joe. I know Joe saw the documentary Thrive. Now, if you haven't seen the documentary Thrive, Thrive is um, it's more than a documentary. It's a movement, and you can find it on the Internet, on, on YouTube. Uh, it's just called the Thrive Documentary, and their catch line to the, the, to the documentary is, What in the World Will It Take? And basically they're referring to to reverse the – uh, what's happening on the earth. And, and they're, they're, they actually do a great uh, explanation of the Illuminati, which I was surprised that they would actually tackle that because this is a pretty mainstream documentary. They, they break down the Illuminati, the banking system, the Federal Reserve, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. They break it down in a, in a really succinct way. And for people who are just getting into this stuff, it's actually very enlightening, the documentary. However, I found it interesting that they even exposed in the documentary this breakaway civilization. And it was a very new agey documentary, but they exposed the, the breakaway civilization that there exists anti-gravity technology, there exists technology that can be implement, implemented across the globe, installed into houses all across the globe, into huts in Africa and South America, and everybody can be enjoying, um, uh, everybody can enjoy, be enjoying the same benefits of, of technology and and um, and be at peace. And and there's an interesting wrench thrown into the whole thing at the end of the documentary, which I actually, when it happened, I actually, it caught me off guard, and, and, and I had an epiphany, and, and, and I began to laugh un- uncontrollably because I realized that uh, where this is going, at least this is my opinion, this is, a, this is, a, this is an Elbrino analysis conjecture, that, that the... What we know is the Illuminati, the New World Order. These guys are becoming very visible at this point, partly because of the Internet, partly because uh, everything is coming to such a head that they can't keep everything secret. But uh, it's, it's becoming ingrained in, in popular culture, the idea of the Illuminati, the hand sim- hit symbols, the Beyonce, the, the, all this kind of stuff that they've been doing for years and years in pop culture, that everybody has an idea at this point uh, even people who really don't too much, do too much time investigating these issues for themselves have this sort of uh, sketchy idea, this sort of nebulous idea that a group called the Illuminati is coalescing power, that the New World Order is coming into formation, and that they want to control us all, the, the prison planet I- ideology, uh, reduce the population of the Earth. A lot of people are awakening to that, and that's a fact. Um, a lot of people are, are, are waking up to, to th- that that's going on. For example, a lot of people are waking up to the fact that the Federal Reserve is not federal, that the banking system is a fraud, um, and, and it's, it, that's actually occurring right now. There is a global awakening. In fact, I find it astounding that even in the jungle cities that I lived in in Peru, the locals, the locals now, because of the Internet, knew about the Illuminati. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. These guys knew about, and I'm not talking about the guys living out in the middle of the Amazon. I'm talking about the, the cities in the jungle. They knew about the Illuminati. They couldn't tell you who the vice president was or, or a single, who a single congressperson was in the United States, but they knew about the Illuminati and the New World Order, and they could tell you a lot of them could, could, could name the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Fe, even the Federal Reserve, uh, which I thought this is astounding. This shows how far spread the knowledge of the New World Order, the, the Illuminati, is, is reaching at this point. And I believe uh, something is going to happen because at the end, going back to the documentary Thrive, um, and I'm trying to piece this together as, uh, as logically as I can, but at the end of the movie Thrive, basically they expose all of this that's going on. There's hidden technology. They bring people on who have actually developed anti-gravitational te- technology uh, that – the agencies of the government came and confiscated their stuff, and, and it's and it's it's all about humanity 2.0, like um, uh, like Darren alluded to that they talk about UFOs. So why am I saying all this? Because at the end of the documentary, there is an occultic New Age movement that they're pushing to overthrow the system, the, the New World Order, and the Illuminati system. 
and that 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 seems like a what's the word a contradiction because isn't it the illuminati isn't the illuminati in the new world order and an occultic system in and of itself the answer is yes it is Luciferian, but then you have now another occultic movement that's growing up simultaneously and understand that in this, in this separate situation that's beginning to foment and grow, that's where you have the singularity. That's where you have Ray Kurzweil. That's where you have transhumanism. That's where you have Barbara Marx Hubbard and conscious evolution, this idea that we're going to evolve humanity to the next state of evolution. So now picture, if you will, two factions that are growing. There's many more than two, but picture, if you will, two separate factions that are growing. On one hand, you have the, the obviously evil, wicked, um, maniacal New World Order that everybody knows about uh, with the Rockefellers and with, the, uh, with all these different characters that have, uh, Kissinger and all these different characters that have become notorious. Okay, that's one side. And then on the other side, you have this idea of transhumanism and, and evolving and, 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 and solving the, 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 uh, the genetic diseases and curing the genetic de de diseases and solving the uh, famine on the earth. And there's this movement that's rising. Um, they want to take this new technology with the singularity and all these uh, cybernetics and uh, cybernetics and nanotechnology and genetics and improve the human condition. That's exactly what their banner is to consciously evolve and to improve the human condition. Really what it is, is it's apotheosis, it's Luciferianism. So the people listening may say, wait a minute, so it's Luciferianism on both sides, and those sides are contradicting one another and seem to be uh, adversaries. Yes, that's exactly what's happening. Because remember, the Illuminati and the New World Order people have gotten in bed with the father of lies. And let me tell you what, 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 what hit me, and it was an epiphany, and I, like I said, I was laughing, uh, laughing my butt off when I, when I came to this part in the documentary, and I realized that these guys who think that they're going to share in the kingdom of Lucifer are actually being used as pawns. These guys that we believe that have so much power and, are, and you know, the, the Queen of England and all these different people, they're actually going to be backstabbed. But isn't that the nature of the kingdom of darkness? I mean, who do they think that they're dealing with? They're not dealing with a benevolent Lucifer. They're dealing with the most deceitful entity in existence that we know of. He's going to backstab them. I believe that the New World Order, the Illuminati, are a scapegoat. And this is my opinion. I'm not speaking for Darren or anybody else. I believe that the Illuminati is a scapegoat. They're, they're supposed to be the bad guy. They're, they don't think that. They really believe. They've bought into Luciferianism 100%. They really believe that they're going to rule and reign with Lucifer. They really believe that they're going to have eternal life. They really believe it. And they're uh, working towards that. But they're going to be backstabbed, in my opinion. They're going to be the scapegoat. There's got to be a scapegoat. And, uh, because I see this other thing rising Humanity 2.0, or some people call it Mankind 2.0. It is a consciously evolved, a, a conscious evolution of the human race into the next phase of humanity. Really, what it is, it's post-human. It's post-human. That's where this is going on the other side of this equation. So they're in, they understand that, they're, that they, these are two contradictory philosophies coming from the same source. That's the exception. Tim, if I can touch on this a little bit, from what I've researched, uh, along with uh, all of the Roswell and the, uh, the, the, the small grays uh, that are, I, I believe are manufactured entities uh, that are quite have nothing to do with the tall grays, or they think they're completely different, but along with some of these uh, ugly, nefarious, very scary entities, uh, subterranean, underground things, Along with that, since World War II, there's also been the careful weaving of another legend. And uh, you guys can comment or whatever if you've heard of these, the Nordics, the, uh, the uh, taller, uh, good-looking, humanoid-type uh, aliens that uh, make contact with people. Uh, and, and even in the, the original Disclosure Project uh, before 9-11, the big one, there was uh, things you can see on YouTube where people say that there's a lot of different races of alien, quote unquote alien entities that are human looking. And uh, supposedly when Eisenhower was making, uh, I mean, he was a really good man from what I can tell, but he was very confused and scared about what was going on with these uh, entities. And he made the deals with, with 
uh, I think it was the tall grays, to be honest, and that's what uh, gave birth to all these deep underground uh, base deals going on. Supposedly, there was another race, a humanoid-looking race, that uh, made contact and said, do not uh, have an agreement with this, this other race. We have been fighting them uh, on our own planet, quote, unquote, for a very long time. You don't want to do that. In fact, we will uh, trade you technology. Uh, come inside with us. But the one uh, clause on that is you have to give up your nuclear program. And, and so this has been you, – anybody can find this, these uh, legends on the Internet. Uh, supposedly that was, their, that was the, the, the deal. Well, uh, Eisenhower didn't know who these people were and – the administration was scared. They want to give up their, their greatest weapon, you know, as they thought at the time. So they made a deal uh, with the uh, the tall grays and uh, with that direction. So then uh, if you uh, really, really uh, research UFO sightings and other things, there's always been this, uh, they've always been around nuclear tests. You would see Phil Schneider even held up a photo of a, of a flying saucer or a craft uh, watching the Bikini Asshole Island explosion. And then you've got other people saying that when a nuclear missile uh, was launched in midair, a craft came and probed the craft, shooting these little rays into it. Other ones were stopping a missile bases uh, or activating missile launch codes and other things like that. And, 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 and a lot of these uh, um, seance or other things have been trying to convey to human beings, essentially, that the nuclear program will mean your own destruction, and we've been trying to save you from it. We tried with Eisenhower. They didn't do the deal, and now look at what you guys have done. So people are, are given these visions of mass destruction of the planet, and uh, that I believe that what Tim is saying, and, and to tie it all together, is that this legend of the Nordics, the good-looking, um, perhaps long-haired, uh, al- human-looking aliens are being this. This tale is being woven so that when they come on the scene, uh, they could. And this is this is my postulation, just like Tim Tim said. So I'm not I'm not even speaking for Tim here. That that they could be the ones that backstab uh, the Illuminati, the, the the politician, the royalty, and the the Greys, and several other really nasty looking uh, entities that we can hardly imagine, and say oh, we we tried. It's our it's our protocol to leave you alone, but you were on the verge of self destruction. You were already nuking each other. Uh, these nuclear power plants had gone off. This group over here. Uh, unleash a plague on this country, and we have the proof right here, and we're going to stop it with our technology. And uh, this EMP took out this entire country's uh, infrastructure. We're going to turn those lights back on. We really didn't want to interfere, but you forced our hand. And by the way, you come from us, and uh, we've been watching you for a very long time, and we were not going to get involved, but we had to because you were going to go extinct. And so uh, Steve Quayle has often said something on these shows that he believed that, that the Lord gave him a vision that, that uh, the sins of the leaders would be revealed in our time. And uh, I think that goes with this, that, that this, these entities that are being carefully readied and crafted are going to double-cross uh, the Illuminati, quote-unquote, I, I hate that word, and uh, royalty, politicians, the people that are uh, made these deals with these subterranean entities, uh, the cloning technology, some of this other, uh, and it's going to be uh, swept away to the amazement of, of, of the humans watching, and they will be worshipped as gods because they will have taken care of, uh, of the great enemy uh, on the planet. They will, they will have all the evidence to show what these people were doing, how they were uh, nuking, how they were making, uh, perhaps even the underground bases. Look at what they were doing in these underground bases. Look at what they were planning. They were planning your destruction. That's why they went under here, and they were releasing these plagues and these nuclear, and they're going to stop all that. Can you imagine the loyalty of those on the surface to a race that would come and and say, you come from us, we're going to save you from from your cataclysm. So, I mean, that is... Yeah, that is that is really painting uh, uh, an accurate picture of something that we really don't know the details. But that would a it would it would go to what I believe Steve Quayle is very correct that we're going to see the sins of our leaders uh, very openly and in our time. It's going to say that men's hearts will fail them for what they see coming up onto the earth because uh, there's going to be some creatures that I'm tracking that 
that make those real things look like uh, child's play. There's, I mean, literally people will die when they see some things. And, uh, and the lights could be going off and the, and the, and the, the pestilence and the snare of the, of the fowler, as the Bible says, will all, all be in play. And if someone is to, to rescue everyone from all of that and turn the lights back on, uh, people will worship the image of, of, this, of, this, of this beast. And understand that um, there will be, uh, at some point in time, there will be the bowls of wrath pour, poured out on the earth. So we're not saying that, that that's fake that will happen as a result of the earth becoming as it was in the days of Noah. The Bible says that in the days of Noah, the judgment of God was executed with water, but that in the final days, the days which will be like the days of Noah, will be executed, the judgment will be executed with fire. And so the, the, we're not saying that the, that, that, that the judgment is a farce. No, it's going to happen. But what's going to happen first, as the apostles uh, said over and over, is the deception, the great falling away is coming first. It hasn't happened yet. And uh, what can unite all the religions of the world? What can unite all these different faiths and ideologies? Well, it's not very difficult if the whole world is in cataclysm and then these beings show up and save us. Listen, by the way, these beings, the government has a name for these beings, these quote-unquote Nordics that, uh, that Darren is referring to. They call them the benevolence. That's what they call them, the benevolence. And, and uh, people who are working inside of our government who are supposedly, they believe they're working for the good, the good side of things against the Illuminati, they, they believe that they're in league with the benevolence. So whether you believe it or not, they do. And so uh, the issue is that uh, something is coming that most people don't even have on their radar. That's why all of this is relevant. Hey, and, Tim, and, can I – oh, go ahead. Oh, can I come I was, back here? And I was just going to say something about uh, – uh, the Daniel prophecy that talked about uh, the last kingdom on earth being uh, iron mixed with clay, mix of clay and iron. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that, or do you want me to comment on that? No, go ahead. I didn't mean to derail you. Well, I just, I mean, if people probably on this program, uh, well, if you don't know about the Daniel prophecy, Google Google that and see it's it's it, where Daniel interpreted a dream and he goes through and he sees a statue and and, and it's different metals. Uh, uh, from the top to the bottom, when he comes to the last, uh, he sees that it's the feet are a mix of iron and clay, and he says that, um, quote unquote, they will, paraphrasing, they will um, mix themselves with the seed of men, and uh, it was well, lost there. Yeah, hey, what he was saying was the uh, yeah, I think we lost the. Them. <clears throat> the, they will not cleave together, as the prophecy in Daniel says that the miry clay and the the iron will not cleave together, will not mix together, uh, and that's what is in the ten toes of the statue uh, in the dream that he was referring to. Go ahead, Tim. Yep, and that that's the final empire, by the way, which is destroyed by the great rock that was carved out of the mountain by the great, great boulder, which is which is the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so um, this is, we're coming to a head here where, uh, see, there's two things happening, and I, and I want to stress this again. There is catastrophe coming on an order greater than anybody can really articulate, uh, really articulate it. People might hear, you know, these guys coming on the radio on this program and saying the economy is going to collapse like me and these other guys, and, and then they say, oh, they're exaggerating. No, no, let me tell you something. They're not exaggerating. They're under-exaggerating. If that's even a word. Sam, they're, I'm they're, back. I don't know. I think I got I got kicked off or something. You guys can hear me now. Yeah, we can. Oh, I'm so yep. Sorry, I just I just uh, I, I I just cut out there for I don't know. I didn't hear what you guys were saying for the last couple of minutes. But go ahead. I, I didn't want to interrupt. I just got kicked off for some reason. No, I was just saying how these guys that are predicting catastrophe, financial catastrophe, they're they're not even able to convey what it's really going to look like because it is going to be an absolute collapse of everything and it is an engineered collapse partly is that there's an engineered part to it and there's a geological part to it and this situation is going to give rise to the call for peace and safety and i don't believe that that peace and safety is going to come from the guys who everybody already knows are the bad guys i think they're the scapegoat 
And when the peace and safety comes, it will come from a class of beings. And believe me, they're going to be fallen angels or they're going to be beings that are taking their orders from fallen angels that are going to show up on the scene and are going to usher humanity into the golden age, the new golden age. And the prophecies in the occult world refer to it as the golden age in which the golden race will arise. And what is the golden race? It is a race of human beings that just like in the golden age of the, uh, of the early days, when the gods mingled with men, that the golden age will be resurrected and men will become like gods again. And that's genetic. That, is a, that, is a, uh, that has genetic connotations to it. And so what we're saying is that this whole thing, where, where, where everything is going, in my opinion, is not Illuminati New World Order in the way that we are thinking about it. It's going towards something that I, it's moving towards something that I call the new human paradigm. It's the new human paradigm in a word, apotheosis. That's where this is all going to. And what's happening right now is setting the stage for humanity to consciously evolve at the behest and at the leadership of these other entities that are coming. And it will be, listen, the genetic revolution is going to happen. Everybody needs to understand that the genetic revolution is inevitable. And that's why the super soldier situation, because whatever the Pentagon's doing in the open, engineering super soldiers, whatever, always is going to leak out to the public intentionally. Always. Not the stuff they're doing under the ground necessarily. The stuff they're doing above board is always going to leak out to the public. It's going to cross over into the public forum. And that's why the... Uh, the half, the human artificial chromosome, the 47th chromosome, is so crucial because through that platform, we can become, as the Luciferians will tell you, like gods. But what we will be doing is we will be sacrificing the genetic trademarks that make us human, okay? Understand that we have gen- genetic trademarks as the human race can, can that make us human. Yeah. Can you hear me, Tim? Yeah. Can you, is it garbled at all? Because it, you guys are sounding a little bit garbled. It's breaking. It's coming in and out. Well, this is what I what, what, – okay, what I was just saying, it seems like everything's okay on my end, but um, that's what I was saying about the uh, the Daniel prophecy about the, the kingdom that was going to mix. I mean, they have to be something that can mix their seed with the seed of men, and that's what Jesus said is, as in the days of Noah, so will it be when, when the Son of Man returns. And that was uh, – nefarious angelic entities mixing themselves with the human race. I mean, the Daniel prophecy spells it out right there, and I'm sure that they'll have a number of ways. You can either, if you're existing already, you can upgrade genetically through the way Tim Tim is talking about, or, uh, you know, you can mix your, I guess, marry, marry uh, in, in, and, and, and have uh, children with, with these things. That's why how convenient that they will be human-looking. But doesn't that kind of answer exactly what he meant by, as in the days of Noah, so will it be when the, when the Son of Man returns? And all of these technologies are converging together. Uh, all of these technologies and the occult and the philosophies behind this, eugenics, conscious evolution, uh, you can imagine it like three circles that are that are being squished together, and in the middle they're going to get the same result or they're all pushing towards the same result, which is the new human paradigm because there is a new human paradigm. We're already seeing it happen. It's already coming into play. How human is human? How human is human? That is not a a, just a rhetorical question. That is a question that guys like Ray Kurzweil, that's a question like the people that the, that the leading transhumanists are already grappling with because the technology is, in the, in the public arena, is almost to the point where we – actually, let me say this. I was and, – and, and this, is, uh, this was pretty uh, astounding to me that I was – the other day I was watching Fox News, and, and they had some guy on that, that I can't remember who he was, but he worked with some kind of a genetics lab, and he made the statement. He said, our lab right now can already change or determine with 100% determine the color of your baby's eyes the color of his hair, his complexion, and some some very uh, some various different uh, um, uh, external features. They can already do that right now. 
and, and this is mainstream, but the guy said, we're not doing it yet. And the commentator, I mean, the, uh, the guy that was interviewing said, asked him, well, why aren't you? And his response was because it, the debate isn't worth it yet. It's not worth debating it yet. That was his response. It's not worth fighting about it yet because ultimately the technology is going to, uh, is going to get to a, a, a place where we won't have any choice. This is how we cure cancer. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. It's going to be integrated inevitably of its own momentum into society. It's coming. It's the genetic revolution. And, and let that sink in. And I know, I know I'm saying that a lot because we're dropping some bombs right now. The technology to change a baby in the womb, to, change the, to, to, um, to control the outcome of the color of their eyes, of the color of their hair, of their complexion is already here, mainstream. The guy said he could do it in his lab tomorrow. Let that sink in. We are right on the cusp of a major uh, genetic revolution, and the, the question of the future is what, is what does it mean to be a human being? By the way, one of these groups, I can't remember if it's, if it's the benevolence or if it's the grades or whatever, these other entities uh, allegedly have shown, back in the 50s and 60s, have shown uh, – President Eisenhower and other people, allegedly, a holographic projection of Jesus being crucified in, uh, of Jesus being crucified on the cross. And their explanation was, we manufactured this whole scenario. It happened, but Jesus was one of us, and we did it for, for A, B, and C. A holographic projection that they claim to be in possession of. Whether or not that's true, imagine the ramifications if that actually surfaced. And I'm and it's absolutely false, obviously false. It's a lie. But imagine the delusion that would that would that would just consume the human populace of the planet. The stuff that we're talking about began to happen uh, in the near future. And whether or not aliens are involved or the Illuminati push all that away and just focus on transhumanism and conscious evolution, humanity 2.0, with, even with all the other elements out of the, of the picture, that is going to happen. It is absolutely going to happen. It's, uh, it, wow. It's incredible. By the way, we, we just lost uh, Darren, um, Tim, so. Uh, as an FYI, so so go ahead and continue. I mean, it, 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 while we try to get Darren back, this is incredible information, and we have uh, twelve minutes left of the show. Just to let you guys know. All right. Yeah, it, you know, so you can imagine, uh, um, you can imagine all of these things converging, all of these things converging together, all the cataclysm, all the financial collapse. That we that we've been warned and warned about, and it is going to happen. Much of it engineered, like I said, a lot of it geological. All of this stuff is converging, and it's converging at a rapid pace right now. Order out of chaos means a lot more than people think. I think that the Illuminati are bringing in the chaos. They think they're going to bring the order, but I don't believe they are. I believe that they're just agents of chaos. The order is coming from somewhere else, and it is going to be far more potent. And it's going to be a delusion and a deception to the likes of which people can't even imagine right now. And, again, it's going to incorporate all these other elements. People are going to say, for example, let me just, get, let me just uh, ratchet this down to a very practical scenario, very practical scenario. I want you to imagine an Ebola-like virus uh, that is spreading across the earth much of the way it is now, but times 100. And millions of people, let's just say hundreds of thousands of people are dying. But somebody comes up with a vaccine or a cure that involves splicing into the human genome genetic information from some animal that's impervious to the disease. Okay? Let's say a raccoon for the sake of argument. So we have uh, some, similar, some similarities between the genome of the hu human being and the genome of the raccoon, which we do. And if we take these genes, these specific, this, these specific group of genes, and we replace them with these specific groups of genes in the human genome, we're not going to get people walking around with raccoon ears and, and black and white stripes, but that genetic material will render the virus 
ineffective against the human race, okay? As crazy as that sounds, I want you to understand that right now, even as we speak, Monsanto is looking into a vaccine for Ebola. It's funding experimentation to develop a vaccine against Ebola. What does Monsanto do? What do they do? Genetic engineering is what they do. And even more specifically, cross-species genetic engineering. That's exactly what we have in our corn crops. We have our, our, our crops now mixed with all kinds of different species of creatures. Monsanto is one of the entities involved in creating a vaccine. What I'm saying is not far-fetched. It is literally right around the corner. The question is, what will you do? What will you do if you have to choose between remaining fully human or dying fully human? I mean, remaining fully human and living fully human, or, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, becoming not fully human and living or remaining fully human and dying. What will you choose? That's not far-fetched. That is a practical scenario, scenario that is right around the corner. I'm telling you, it's right around the corner. And like I said, the fact that Monsanto is involved in working on uh, a, a cure or vaccination for Ebola should, should, should absolutely confirm that what I'm saying is true. And it They're coming up with genetic cures. And Tim, that makes it so much more important, the fully, fully God, fully manhood of Jesus Christ, that he was fully man so that he could die for Fully right. men. Right. So could you yeah, expound on that just a little bit? Yeah, there are, uh, even in the book uh, Exo Vaticana from, by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, they, they deal with this question, which is, which is a crucial question. How, what are the, what are the um, factors involving redemption of clones? Are clones redeemable? Are genetic, uh, cross-species genetic humanity 2.0 people redeemable? How human does one have to be to qualify for salvation via the cross of Jesus Christ? I mean, th these are questions that churches should be dealing with right now in the face of the rise of transhumanism. Churches across the, the world should be dealing with these issues, but they're not. They're dealing with peripheral issues and, and, and how, to, how to get richer and and that worshiping God is actually for us. It's not really uh, for God. It's like uh, Joel Osteen's wife said the other day. They're going to be blindsided. Everybody is going to be blindsided by the genetic revolution. Very few people are preparing themselves um, for the implications of genetic of a genetic technology that we already have. Again, let me tell you the two things that we already have right now. This is not conspiratorial. This is documented fact. We have, number one, the ability to change a baby's, the color of a baby's eyes, hair, complexion, and some other superficial uh, details um, of their appearance. We have that for sure. Number two, we have artificial chromosomes. We have a chromosome, a hack, a human artificial chromosome that is capable of changing up to one million base pairs at a time inside of a, inside of the genome. One million base pairs at a time, and it is a human artificial chromosome. So just take those two pieces of data and then add in the Monsanto situation. That should be enough to prove to anybody listening that is having uh, a hard time accepting what I'm saying right now. That is the proof. This is happening. It's happening right now, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in it or not. If not you, your children are going to have to decide whether or not they're going to upgrade to Humanity 2.0. And if they don't, they're going to be there's – new, there's a new faction of human beings. There's a, there's a new um, division of race that's coming. I'm not very articulate right now, but there's a, there's a, there's a separation that's coming within the human race. There is a, those who are electing to upgrade and those who, are, who aren't. And how do you think that those who aren't are going to fare in society? I mean, imagine your child having to go to college and compete – with other people's children to have cerebral cortex upgrades because they have chips in their cerebral cortex that allow them to store vast amounts of information. This is coming. How is your child going to compete in, in university against these kinds of, of upgraded human beings? 
The answer is they're not. They're not. There's a new, uh, what's, the, what's the term I'm looking for, a new societal break. There's a new lower class. Let's just put it that way. And those of us who will choose not to be a part of Humanity 2.0, we're it. We're going to and be Tim, the I dumb Tim, Neanderthals. Tim, they've, I think as you, we've talked about before, the likes of Barbara Marks Hubbard and the transhumanists have already made up their mind that there's a vast section of humanity that isn't fit for the upgrade anyway. That's why I think you and me agree, or you and I agree, that, uh, that this, these problems that you're describing now are probably not going to face anyone until after the great meltdown. So they, they want to get rid of a, a large swath of humanity just through the great meltdown so that from the ashes, the new Atlantis can arise, probably in this country. It could par- perhaps... Uh, we won't even be here. It'll be in another country. But uh, these these tough uh, questions and um, issues that we're facing about the great upgrade to the mark of the beast or genetic enhancements uh, are going to face those people that make it through uh, some of the meltdown that's about to come upon us. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 let me let me in closing. Let me. You, you, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think I've read this on the year before, and I know other people have. But but let me make this crystal clear, not through my words, but just what uh, Darren alluded to, the words of Barbara Marks Hubbard, who is the leader of conscious, the Conscious Evolution Movement. This is, from, this is actually from the book Brotherhood of Darkness by, uh, by uh, Dr. Stanley Monteith at the end of the book. It says, some people believe, let me say, hold on a second, here we go. Barbara Marks Hubbard is one of the leaders of the New Age movement. In her book, The Book of Co-Creation, She discusses the hidden meaning of the revelation of St. John the Divine. Her manuscript was channeled by a spirit she called the Christ Light. She quoted from Revelation 6, 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed him, and with the power was given, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. This is Barbara Marks Hubbard channeling this entity. The Christ Light explained the true meaning of that passage. Out of the full spectrum of human, of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend with all their heart, mind, and spirit. One-fourth is resistant to election. They are unattracted by life forever evolving. Their higher self is unable to penetrate the density of their mammalian senses. They cannot be reached. They are defective seeds. Now as we approach the quantum shift from creature human to co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse, death. We come to bring death to those who are unable to know God. We do this for the sake of the world. The riders of the pale horse are about to pass among you, grim reapers. They will separate the wheat from the chaff. This is the most painful period in in the history of humanity. You do not have to participate in the destruction. You are to be responsible for the construction which shall begin as the tribulation comes to an end. That was uh, spoken through Barbara, Barbara Marks Hubbard through an entity that she was channeling. So that shows you what they think about us. Uh, that's phenomenal. Gentlemen, we've reached to the end of the program. I just want to say thank you, uh, Timothy Alvarino, the Alvarino Analysis Darren Geisinger, Darren, also a researcher with Timothy Alberino. Folks, go to stevequail.com. On the right-hand side is a link to the Alberino analysis. Uh, sometime within the next uh, 12 hours, it'll be on Hagman and Hagman.com, and you'll be able to link directly to it from Hagman and Hagman.com. But for now, it's stevequail.com. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. You've been very gracious with your time. I know that. Uh, You've, uh, you don't feel you don't feel well, but uh, you did very well in explaining this, which is, uh, boy, I do hope you come back because there's so much more to talk about. Darren, thank you so much for thank, your expertise. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate appreciate being on. Keep up the good work, you guys. All right, sir, and and Tim, thank you so very much for everything you, you do. Thanks. God bless you, my friend. Please, both thank of you, you, back on. God bless you guys. Okay, it was yeah, a great show. Night. Well, folks, that'll do it for us. Until tomorrow, just stay safe. God bless tomorrow. We have a very special guest, the author, Bill Bissar. Bill Bissar, the author of 95 Theses. That's going to be an incredible program. You don't want to miss that. Until tomorrow, stay safe and have a good night.